you. Uh, just to say a few words about active appendicitis, it's a very common surgical entity that you would encounter in your day-to-day -day practice. And it will be the house officer who will be diagnosing these patients, who will be instituting initial management and preparing the patient for surgery. So without much further ado, let me tell you basic things about, house, uh, about acute appendicitis that the house officer should be uh, aware of. Acute appendicitis is acute inflammation of the vermiform, uh, vermiform appendix, as you all know. It's a very common cause of surgical acute appendicitis. Any given day, you will have several patients coming with acute appendicitis into your surgical emergency admission. Although it's a quite common condition, it's uncommon in the extremes of age. As you are aware, it's not very common in children below two years, uh, babies, I would say, and elderly people, uh, the appendix atrophies and therefore appendicitis becomes an un uncommon entity. However, if you see appendicitis occurring in an elderly or old person, you have to think of any underlying pathology, particularly cervical cancer and so on, that would have given rise to secondary appendicitis in the elderly. Uh, they believe that this uh, precedes luminal obstruction of the appendix and the inflammation begins at the luminal uh, mucosal level. The most important thing about acute appendicitis that I want to emphasize is that it's a clinical diagnosis. No investigation will tell you that this is appendicitis. It's your clinical initial clinical impression that uh, tells you that this is appendicitis and this possibility is appendicitis. Imaging and other blood investigations are only supportive. Of course, the treatment of appendicitis is appendicectomy. There are increasingly articles coming to say that appendicitis could be managed with antibiotics and so on. But for our purposes, you must take into your head that all the appendicitis patients would require surgery uh, sooner or later. However, in presentation, some people don't present with initial symptoms. They present a few days later. Sometimes they present after a week or so, where they have given treatment from a GP and partially treated, thus localizing the inflammation rather than completely curing it. And they come with what is called mass force, which means the inflamed appendix is encircled by the omentum, which is called the polysphon in the abdomen. Omentum and terminal ileum and the cecum all come together, try to enclose the inflamed appendix. Uh, the idea is to prevent spread of this infection. So when this mass formation occurs, it generally forms in about three, four days, the surgery becomes a difficult thing because when you try to dissect the mass, there will be a high risk of damage to uh, bars, particularly the ileum and the cecum. So therefore, in a, if the patient presents with appendicular mass, you may not intend to operate on that patient uh, up front. So I will come into all that, just a few introductory words about appendicitis and then let's get on with the rest of it. I told you at the beginning, appendicitis is a clinical entity and the diagnosis is clinical. So what are the symptoms and signs that would give you a uh, sort of a hint that this could be appendicitis? The most common complaint is they have right lower quadrant abdominal pain. And the most uh, classical thing about this pain it is probably the most important factor about this pain is that it's a migrating type of pain. Pain begins in the central abdomen because appendix is a mid-gut structure. And as the inflammation increases and the inflamed appendix touches the parietal peritoneum, then the pain gets localized to the right aliacosa or the McBurney's point area. So initial central abdominal pain, which is vague and uh, poorly localized, is in the central abdomen. Then migrating into the RIA would be the most common suggestive feature in appendicitis. Then, of course, they will have nausea, they will vomit. Anorexia is another important uh, clinical feature of appendicitis where the, uh, the, the patient will complain to you that he or she is anorexic. And fever, the important thing about appendicitis fever is that it's not a high swinging fever. If you have a RIF pain and a high swinging fever and it's unlikely to be appendicitis, of course, it keeps us progressed into abscess formation, no rupture or whatever, but they are again with localized peritonitis or whatever, but they are again, that is the late presentation. If somebody comes with abdominal pain and high grade fever, you have to think of something else other than appendicitis. If the symptom duration is about a day or two, appendicitis generally gives rise to a low grade fever and tachycardia. When you examine the face of the abdomen, there will be tenderness in the McBurney's point. You all know what the McBurney's point is, it is in the RIF, and there will be rebound tenderness. Rebound tenderness is when you press on that point, 
and abruptly withdraw your hand from the abdomen, there will be excruciating pain. That is called rebound tightness. You press it and let go immediately, the pain will be excruciating. That would be on the neck burning, so it's quite suggestive of acute appendicitis. So these are the symptoms and signs that you have to remember. This is the case that we are just for interested. A patient who had left-sided appendix, which is a, which is a di di diagnostic dilemma, a patient who I operated, left side of course I already in the patient with situs inverses. So think of that possibility. Also, I have just seen one, I think, uh, but it may be a possibility that patients with situs inverses would come with left symptom rather than left uh, right side. Investigations, as I told you, since the clinical diagnosis again and again, I'm emphasizing this fact. Uh, the investigations are merely supportive, they are not conclusive. So, only uh, uh, support, uh, clinical uh, diagnosis, you, if you do a complete blood count, there will be neutrophil leukocytosis. But this is not the case in most of the patients because they present uh, quite early. The, uh, the anticipated white cell elevation may not be present in some or most of these patients. They will still have normal white cells and CR will be elevated. If you do ultrasound scan, which again done in the female patient, primarily done not to diagnose appendicitis, but to exclude other differential diagnosis, particularly in the female patients, there are things like ectopic pregnancies, twisted low variancy, pelvic uh, inflammatory diseases, and things like that might be picked up on the ultrasound scan and might be helpful to say that this is that rather than appendicitis. Appendix is sometimes picked up on ultrasonography in high resolution probe, where the appendix is non-peristaltic, congested, edematous, tubular structure. So um, that is how uh, the ultrasound, the role that ultrasound plays, plays in appendicitis. But you are quite certain on your clinical grounds that this is appendicitis, particularly in the male patient, they are hardly going to wait for ultrasound scan for confirmation. Uh, you might as well proceed with clinical depression and the basic hematology and the uh, uh, other investigation. CTT very rarely performed in very doubtful cases and patients who are risk for surgery and that kind of thing. Right? Uh, urine pregnancy test is very important in any female of reproductive life for any acute abdomen, not only uh, appendicitis for any other condition as well, but here it cannot be overemphasized that the urine pregnancy test is mandatory for you embark on appendicitis because ectopic pregnancies can limit acute appendicitis that you have to remember very important and urine pool report uh, now they will have urine microscopic hematuria because the inflamed appendix might lie on the ureter causing some inflammation of the ureter and that might give us to a little bit of hematuria microscopic hematuria and then you might wonder whether this is appendicitis or ureteric fault still just because hematuria is present, microscopic hematuria, don't be carried away that it, will, it could still be appendicitis because uh, the inflamed appendix can give rise to hematuria by irritation of the urine. So the difference of diagnosis, if you go through the list, there will be an enormous list on the literature, but just to tell you the common ones, uh, that are of importance as a house officer, the possibilities that you have to keep in your head rather than write down in there. Are uh, the ectopic pregnancy not very common, but it's worthwhile remembering that in the females of reproductive age, they don't have to be married. They will say that they have never had any sexual exposure, but nevertheless, it could be the case. Just remember that possibility all the time. Exclude pregnancy before the patients are taken for surgery, and if you have any slightest doubt, twisted ovariancy, pelvic inflammatory diseases in, in the sexually active female. Meckel's diverticulum can be undergo inflammation and then to form as Meckel's diverticulitis, ureteral polyps, pyelonephritis, gastroenteritis, mesenteric lymphadenitis. All these are differential diagnoses. Gastroenteritis is sometimes appendix can lie on the ileum and irritate the ileum and give rise to a gastroenteritis kind of a diarrhea. But remember that it could still be appendicitis rather than rather than uh, gastroenteritis. So these things overlap. The symptoms and signs overlap and it becomes a quite a bit of a dilemma to diagnose appendicitis. I'm telling you again and again, appendicitis is a clinical diagnosis and therefore the accuracy of diagnosing appendicitis is to the tune of 80%. So you don't be upset that you picked up a patient as appendicitis and found to be something else.
okay, the accuracy ratings. There have been several scoring systems which have been proposed, and Alvarado score is for probably the commonly used one. And uh, this is the scoring system. I don't expect you to know out of them, but it's worthwhile dropping it down and keeping it under your glass pad because then you will be able to work yourself out and say, okay, work, working out to say whether this is appendicitis or not. The score is like 10 points. If you have a score of less than five, they say it's unlikely to be appendicitis. If you have a score of more than seven, it's appendicitis. Between five to seven, of course, then the need for further imaging like ultrasound scan and if the patient is exceptionally risky for surgery or an elderly population or whatever, there's a place for CT scan provided we have resources. In the National Hospital, again, we don't have CT facilities uh, available just like that for appendicitis, but if you have facilities in your institution, you, it, it's a limited number of very uh, small population of patients, uh, you may still uh, go for CT scan, provided it doesn't cause delay in patient management. So let's go through this score briefly. Migratory, I, I have to have a migratory pain, right? One point, anorexia, one point, Nausea and vomiting, one point. Right cardiac pressure, tenderness, two points. Rebound tenderness, one point. Fever, one point. Leukocytosis, two points. Shift to left, that means segmental neutrophils, neutrophil leukocytosis, that is one point. So this is the scoring system that has been proposed by Alvarado, quite widely used, particularly in the population which are dice. We are some of the patients, young patients coming with appendicitis, you have tenderness, rebound tenderness. Symptoms, you don't need any further scoring system, so investigations on that patient. However, if there's a patient who's dicey, you may resort to just uh, check on this Alvarado score. So how do you manage? That's the most important part that as a house officer that you have to bear in your mind. Appendicitis management diagnosis is in the hands of the house officer because consultants expect you to diagnose this, expect you to institute initial management, keep the patient prepared for surgery. So let's see. The thing that I emphasize here is any patient coming with RIF pain, just prepare for surgery. Whether it's appendicitis or something else, keep the patient needle by mouth. Don't start from that point or not. Until senior review is done, keep the patient needle by mouth. Since the patient is kept needle by mouth, you may start IV fluids because the patients are anorexic. They are vomiting. Some of them are not taken adequately. So they might there might be an element of dehydration and you are going to keep the patient fasting as well. So on top of it. So maintenance fluids of normal saline would be helpful. If you have confirmatory uh, confirmation that this could be diagnosis, particularly surgery is a little, taking a little time in the busy setup, you may start antibiotics preoperatively. The antibiotics that are commonly used are tefuroxine, 750 milligram IV, and metronidazole, 500 milligram IV, given three times daily. You can give some paracetamol with a sip of water. Keeping the patient fasting does not mean that you can't give medications via mouth. You can still give the medication with a sip of water, even in the fasting patients. Uh, the fasting is primarily for food than uh, water, but here, of course, just a sip of water for drugs will not do much harm. The, the appendicectomy, uh, the thing to bear in mind is appendicectomy widely used, particularly in countries like ours, perform open. However, the gold standard uh, surgery for acute appendicitis in the country is laparoscopic appendicectomy. I'll tell you what are the advantages of appendicectomy, right? Okay, laparoscopic appendicectomy. The appendicectomy is commonly performed open. We may make an incision under general anesthesia. The commonly made incisions are lens incision or grid diagnosis. Lens is cosmetically acceptable. Little like uh, going transverse across the abdomen, just a small one. And you don't cut the muscles, you split the muscles and get into the peritoneal cavity. And most importantly, remember, you have to send this specimen for histology. Just because it looks inflamed doesn't mean that it is nothing but appendicitis. You have to send this specimen without any failure for histological analysis because reality, things like carcinoid tumors and so on can exist in the appendix. And in the elderly population, probably there may be underlying malignancy of the symptom, which has caused luminal obstruction of the appendix and would be the manifestation of a cancer rather than appendicitis itself. The female, I'm telling you again and again, laparoscopic appendicectomy is the, is the treatment of choice because the advantage is that it's cosmetically acceptable, minimal scar-related complication. The greatest advantage is that faster recovery and the ability for you to do a 
peritoneal survey. In the male patient, of course, you go in with a small incision, probably two inch incision. In the female, if you go with the laparoscope, you can see the entire abdomen. You can see the ovaries, you can see the tubes, you can see the uterus, you can see the situation of the pouch of Douglas. Then you can evaluate all this called bowel walk and see whether there are diverticular diseases or anything like that. That might mean appendicitis. At least in the female patients, endeavor to do appendicectomy through laparoscopic route, right? At, unfortunately, in the national hospital where I work, laparoscopy is not readily available for. Uh, emergencies, unfortunately, because the laparoscopy test has been out of order for several years in NHSL in the emergency theater. But I gather in other hospitals, which are less, less uh, prominent hospitals, which are much fortunate, the laparoscopy is available 24 7 in all other smaller hospitals that I work. So, for some patients are actually more benefited than coming to National Hospital, they are the female patients at least are subjected to laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy. And if you find any other illness, uh, like um, twisted ovary, cyst or EID or something like that, you deal with it appropriately and you don't do appendicectomy. If you find can't find anything else, but uh, appendix is a doubtful uh, inflammation, still it's worthwhile taking the appendix out. But if you find any other uh, focus of inflammation, you don't do appendicectomy. You address that issue and come out. So uh, that's the role of laparoscopic appendicectomy in the female patient. Post appendicectomy care, I just thought I should do this slide because post appendicectomy care is in the hands of the house officer. We depend on depend a lot on the house officer to pre op optimization and post op care of our patient. So, how do you manage the post appendicectomy patient? You monitor pulse, you monitor the blood pressure, you check the input and output. Right? Initially, you keep the patient nil by mouth until the patient settles and patient says, I am hungry. But anyway, I would say that you would. Keep the patient passing until seen by a senior, right? Some senior house of the or register will decide whether the patient can be fed because these ward are happening quite frequently on an emergency day. So you can't just keep the patient, particularly the patients who have had a complicated appendix where people have to do a lot of dissection, they have appendix has ruptured and so on. So might as well keep those patients passing until they are seen by the senior. Uncomplicated appendix probably you can start feeding a little early. IV fluids until the bleeding is established. It, as I told you a while ago, the patient who's had appendicectomy, uncomplicated appendicectomy, might be able to take fluids immediately, like two or four hours after. And those patients who are, can tolerate fluids can be uh, stopped giving IV antibiotics. Analgesics, you don't have to give a great deal of analgesics because it's not a muscle cutting incision, it's a muscle splitting, where you split the muscle fibers and get into the peritoneal cavity. The other pain is not that much as in a normal case of laparotomy, but however, things like paracetamol, so a short talk morphine also, and a diclofenac support circuitry in the initial stages might be. Standard uncomplicated appendicitis, people believe three doses of antibiotics are good enough. You don't have to do any more because you have removed the focus of appendicitis, focus of inflammation that is appendix, and you believe that the inflammation is confined to the appendix. However, if the patient has had ruptured appendix or uh, the patient has had a localized abdomen mass or anything like that, we believe then the inflammation has spread beyond the limits of the appendix. Therefore, those patients probably will require therapeutic intravenous antibiotics for three to five days. And these patients are kept fasting as well because that goes as a management of peritonitis, right? Although localized. So, delayed patients is another thing that I would want to tell you. A bit about uh, a bit. Some patients, particularly in the periphery, don't present you initially. Some people with the abdominal pain and nausea walking present you on the same day within a matter of few hours. There are others who will keep this with them for days and days. They go to the GP, DPO, taking some native treatment and take their own medication and come with a mass donation after a few days. Those patients. Can, are not candidates for primary surgery. If the mass is big and the patient is toxic, of course, you will keep them nil by mouth. You keep, give them IV antibiotics, IV fluids, and simple analgesics, and you monitor them carefully. With this regimen, which is called Postner Terran Regimen, which is for conservative management of an appendicular mass, we will help to resolve the appendicular mass. So, if the patient responds well, that means the tachycardia comes down, fever comes down, 
as abdominal signs resolve, patients become better, then of course you can give IV antibiotics for a few days and then discharge the patient on oral antibiotics. After about, uh, in about a week's time, you get the patient down to the clinic and advise the patient if there's any problem, please report to the ward immediately. And if the patient is well, you review the patient in a week's time and see how the patient is and then you have to fix them, just there are different schools of thought, but anyway, the traditional way of doing it is to fix them for interval appendicectomy in six weeks time, when the NAS has resolved. However, if you keep the patient with appendicular NAS on IV antibiotics, IV fluids, and not operate while in the board, some people resolve, most of them resolve. Very rare population will not resolve, they will continue to have high CV fever, tachycardia, and under. And abdomen will be guarding tender rebound and cool down because of localized or generalized development. Then, of course, you will have to suspect what is called appendicular abscess. Appendix has ruptured and post abscesses, where the antibiotics play a minimal or no role. When there are abscess formation, like elsewhere in the body, this abscess needs drainage. Commonly, appendicular abscesses are drained under general anesthesia in the operating theater. So, you take those patients to the operating theater, you drain the appendicular abscess, take away whatever necrotic tissue is there, and come out. Sometimes you might be able to take the fragments and appendix during this operation, but complete formal appendicectomy it might not be feasible. However, these patients who have had appendicular abscesses and who have undergone surgery, we believe that appendix is completely fragmented and fibrous, so there might not be a need for interval appendicectomy in this small population of people. So, appendicular abscesses, they are your conservative management, failed in appendicular mass. And that is something that you have to bear in your mind. Surgery in appendix uh, uh, titis is diagnostic laparoscopy and laparoscopic appendicectomy. Male open appendicectomy, and don't forget to send the appendix for histology and post operatively, you have to monitor the patient. So that's a brief uh, overview of appendicitis. What a house officer should know, not a complete account by any means. The summary. Let me tell you the summary is one of the most common causes of laparotomy. It's uh, although appendicectomy goes as a laparotomy. Common surgical problem, you will encounter appendicitis every day as a house of the in your ward. So be ready about it. And the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. Be careful with that. You are the one who are going to diagnose it. Be mindful about the differential diagnosis, particularly in the female. It's uncommon in the extremes of age. Think of cervical cancer if you find an uh, elderly patient coming with appendicitis and those patients, even with appendices in play, you will have to carefully send the specimen for biopsy and when he settles, you have to do a full colonoscopy to visualize the smooth. Delayed presentation with mass formation may be managed on osteoterrain treatment, which is conservative management until the mass resolves and then we send the patient home and get them down for uh, formal appendicectomy, which is called interval appendicectomy in six weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now see whether you have any questions on that. Over the balance. Thank you very much, sir. That was Dr. Dominda Arigatta on the topic of appendicitis. So, I think we can go to the next lecture by Dr. Amal Priyanta, consultant surgeon on uh, gastritis. We, we will send you the presentation. Uh, yes, presentation we are asking. Hello. Well, yeah, we're just uh, starting.
Uh, hello, Hirun. I'm Dr. Malpriyanta. Good morning, everybody. First of all, let me thank the College of Surgeons for inviting me to do this lecture. Right, okay, let's start. So I'll start with a small uh, historical note because I think you have to understand the difference of management of gastritis then and now. So I'm talking about when we were medical students. Uh, there was a very limited understanding of symptoms, especially dyspepsia uh, was not very well defined or dyspeptic symptoms or not very well defined. Uh, especially when it comes to functional disorder, uh, disorder, which is the largest group of uh, dyspeptic symptoms, come for most of the patient and also, also misdiagnosed as chronic gastritis. So uh, it was not very clear whether there was functional symptoms or not at that time. And we had very limited understanding of the, uh, uh, the pathology of gastritis because we have very limited investigators like barium meal, which was uh, especially single contact, which is not notoriously uh, the, uh, low sensitive. And only the acid output studies were available as other measures like maximum and basal addiction. And also regarding the diet, there was a lot of myths surrounding. A lot of people, uh, uh, those days the doctor said, to miss the meal or not taking meals on time, uh, even a spicy food can cause gastritis, which a lot of people still believe and still being taught in medical schools. And also long-standing gastritis is, can cause the cancer. So those are the myths which we continue to believe uh, still. So one of the main purpose of my lecture is to teach you that these are not uh, recognized anymore. So especially from your generation, you should and change these And also, those days there were not hardly any medication. Of the cyanidine was the gold standard, which is actually obsolete now. So, I would say there were three key developments which led to a greater understanding of gastritis during our era, especially the development of the endoscope. It started with guest of camera. This is a guest of camera. This is a Japanese invention. Well, all we could do is we can just we could just pass this into the stomach and take a black and white photograph. That, that's how we investigated that at that point. Then came the uh, uh, fiber optic endoscope, which was a major development, followed by CCD camera, which led to the development of video endoscopy. And from there onward, we, our understanding of gastritis has hugely changed. Then followed by coma endoscopy. And nowadays we have uh, the coma endoscopy even uh, has been replaced by what is called the image intensifier. Then another discovery was the uh, detection of H. pylori as the cause of gastritis. A lot of people believe at that time the no uh, organism could survive in uh, stomach because of the acidity. But the two Australian scientists uh, uh, Warren. Uh, Barry Marshall, gastroenterologist, and uh, Peter B. Warren, uh, pathologist, they were, they, they were convinced that there is some organism in the stomach. So they were trying to alter this. So it's an accidental discovery. One day, uh, they have left the alter plates in the incubator during the weekend. During It was a long weekend. And they forgot to take it out. And when they came back uh, for the work, they found this organism is gone. So they were convinced that there is an organism. And further studies led to the development of uh, the, the detection of H. pylori as the main cause of gastritis. So this uh, discovery actually won the Nobel Prize in 2005. So this is Barry Marshall. And from there on, our understanding is uh, very much wider. So now I will talk mainly about gastritis and dyspepsia separately because they are more or less related. So when you say gastritis, we have acute gastritis, which is not a, at all a challenging condition to diagnose. But it, when it comes to chronic gastritis, 
lot of people believe all the destructive symptoms are due to chronic uh, gastritis, which is not true. Right? That is the main uh, uh, take home message from this lecture. So I will uh, briefly explain that. And they will, I will tell you how to investigate and treatment, uh, treat, take treatment with patient. So a few, few words about active gastritis. I mean, anybody can diagnose this. Uh, it's very short duration, epigastric pain or discomfort, very severe case can cause bleeding. Usually there is a history of some offending agents, especially NSAID, aspirin, alcohol. A spirally will cause acute gastritis if you uh, ingest it in very large doses. Otherwise, they will go unnoticed. So, hardly any investigations are negative. If you examine, there will be a little bit of efficacy tenderness. But I must caution that if the patient is having very severe gastric pain, you have to think of other conditions, especially like myocardial infarction, which has been sometimes confusing, and also other things like. Uh, biliary colics, polycystitis, and pancreatitis. So remember that, uh, that those are comes under differential diagnosis. But if you suspect, if you think this is clinically acute uh, gastritis, hardly any investigations are required. The treatment is proton pump inhibitors nowadays. So uh, this is a mechanism of acute gastritis. I mean, that about you know. Actually, NSAIDs and aspirin and so uh, they interfere with the uh, prostaglandin production, which in turn interfere with the mucus uh, production of the mucus layer. And there is a breakdown of the uh, mucus layer, and that will expose the mucosa to acid, and that will cause gastritis. A few words about the chronic gastritis and H. pylori, how H. pylori can cause chronic gastritis. I think it's important for you to understand. Very, very important to remember that the, uh, the H. pylori is spread by uh, food. But there are various foods. I especially put this slide up because a lot of people believe still uh, you have to eat on time and you should not uh, fast, otherwise it will cause gastritis. Especially nowadays, still patients come and complain, I missed the meal yesterday and I got gastritis. But they, uh, they would know that the food hygiene is more important than eating on time. So I have seen sometimes people eating on trains and buzzers and without washing their hands and all these things. That, that will actually promote this uh, because that is, we have to avoid uh, uh, taking contaminated food. Then, if you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you uh, in just a large dose of pylori, it can cause gastritis, acute. Otherwise, it will go unnoticed. So, small amount, actually, majority of them will destroy it in the stomach. Stomach, but however, they they are very well adapted adapted to survive in the stomach. So, they can evade the invasion immune system in our stomach, and they will colonize our stomach. They will therefore they will start doing, uh, causing chronic inflammatory condition called the chronic gastritis. And the chronic gastritis in turn will result in three major events. That is altered cell function, altered cellular growth and altered differentiation. And the subsequent, all subsequent developments are due to all, all the three, these three mechanisms. So they will either produce uh, peptic ulceration or they will produce atrophy ulceration, atrophy and metaplasia leading to cancer. So that is the say, uh, sequence of event uh, when you have chronic gastritis. Right. So just to tell you that when you have espionary gastritis, there are two major pattern, patterns. This is very important. Uh, if you have antral predominant gastritis, that will cause a rodent ulcer because you are acid that is uh, higher. If you have pan gastritis, that means uh, entire stomach is uh, colonized by the stomach or the pylori. Actually, your acid is reduced because there is hardly any uh, stomach mucosa to produce. Uh, so, so, giving PPI will not going to help. So, actually, because of this altered mucosa, it can lead to gastric ulceration. They are no longer resistant to gastric uh, acid. Right. So much for the gastric. Now. So this is a very nice diagram of 
dyspeptic symptom, right? This is uh, published by uh, Australian uh, gastroenterologist called Michael Camillari, very famous gastroenterologist. This is this will help you to understand the the patient to understand their symptom because they find it sometimes difficult to express their their symptom. It is a pain or bloating or so. So starting from here, it may be the very you know, heavy stomach, the tight tightening pain, uh, aching pain, burning pain, bloating, rumbling, uh, vomiting, heartburn. And belching. Those are the main symptoms that are categorized under display. <coughs> right? So, what I mean is when the patient comes, we have to ask specifically what he actually, what, how do they feel? It's a burning or bloating or discomfort or whatever it is. So, that is the starting point. Without that, we cannot analyze the symptoms. Unfortunately, nowadays, most of the people, they will come and say, I have this type. So then we have to go back and ask actually how do you feel here? What do you mean by this type? It's a pain or coolness or bloating. Then only they will come out. So this is very, very important to remember to analyze their symptoms first. Then second thing is to uh, find out the their deviation and so on. So uh, remember dyspepsia can be caused by organic as well as functional uh, disorder. The main organic uh, causes that will respond uh, the responsible for chronic is septic symptoms include peptic ulceration. You can see a large peptic ulcer, uh, gastric ulcer here. Preflux esophagitis, uh, goes on disease sometimes because it is especially if they come with uh, the biliary colic, gastric pain. A lot of people mistake this for acute gastritis. And uh, of course, if you have chronic, uh, dyspeptic symptom, don't forget it could be malignancy, though it, the percentage is very small. So, it's very important to uh, remember that. Then, the majority of them, uh, if you investigate them, you don't find any cause, then we call it functional uh, disorder that includes the chronic gastritis, uh, induced gastritis, as well as other functional. Bowel disorder. There are a whole heap of functional bowel disorders. Uh, <coughs> actually, the functional bowel disorders are uh, dealt by the wrong criteria. This, there is a uh, institute uh, called the Rome Foundation who extensively deal with functional bowel disorder. So that's another topic. Then, what about the status of expiry in Sri Lanka? Remember, uh, it's very important. This is very small, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, because though we are above, we are not as clean as you know, other Japan and Korea. Strangely, our expiry incidence is very low. So this couple of studies, about in this study about four uh, percent. So this is study by us uh, some time back. It was about thirty percent out of the uh, tested patient. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is, it is the percentage is small. So why I am telling you this, but if you can't find a cause, please don't treat them as expiry because you are treating unnecessary a large group of patients. So please don't start anti-expiry treatment because it will lead to expiry resistance. Now this is a fairly old slide, uh, uh, but it, what it says is now if you look at the, uh, the Western countries, their resistance is very low. But you underdeveloped countries that include South Asia. Now they have shown their antibiotic resistance very, very high. This is because of indiscriminate use of anti H. pylori treatment. Unfortunately, it happens in Sri Lanka. That is why I want to highlight this. Because some of you may people become general practitioners. This is notorious for in our country. They just give H. pylori treatment if they can't find any cause. Please don't do that. Without testing, don't do anti-H. pylori treatment. Otherwise, it's become a real problem uh, if you have uh, antibiotic resistance. Nowadays, we have a, a lot of antibiotic resistance. So instead of triple therapy, that we have to use quadruple therapy. That is combination of four drugs. And that is quite expensive and also very difficult to take. Right. So how do you assess the patient in this? As you know, the usual clinical trial, the trial, clinical trial, the, that is the clinical history examination, and then maybe endoscopic and expiratory test may be included. 
So history and examination, I don't want to, I mean, ask you the medical ability. That's basic history, abdominal examination, and general examination. So if you have a patient with dyspeptic symptom, after clinical evaluation, what are you going to do? Are you going to test them or are you going to treat them? That is the billion dollar question. So these are two different strategies. Let me uh, explain to you. There is a group of uh, people who believe everybody should undergo tests uh, to rule out uh, like cancer or other organic. So they will subject all, all the patients to uh, endoscopy or test. Other group will say, okay, we will treat provided they don't have what is called the alarm features. So we will first treat uh, in a group of, so you have to first isolate the people who are at high risk or people who are having alarm features or red flag sign. So if you don't have this red flag sign, then of course it's quite reasonable to undertake treatment first and then reassess in about three to four weeks, two to three weeks. If you don't uh, have response, then of course that is reasonable to uh, send them for testing. So that is the other strategy. So you have two strategies. One is first to test them or treat them. So uh, there are distinct advantages and disadvantages to these things. So there is a controversial area. So I will let, let you know, then you can decide. So if you keep on testing for everybody, you will be unnecessarily testing a lot of people because only uh, all about 30, 20 to 30 percent will have some organic disease, and out of that, about two percent will have cancer. So Identify 2% of cancers, treating large number of patients is not warranted because it will result in morbidity, mortality, morbidity, especially and a lot of costs nowadays, especially in a country like uh, Sri Lanka and third world countries, it is, it is it's really impossible. So for us, I think best uh, strategy is to uh, treat first and then uh, test. So here, what we do is we take a whole history examination and see whether there are so-called alarm or red flag signs. So if you have a patient who are over 50 years and coming with recent onset dyspepsia, not a long stand, uh, recent onset dyspepsia, that is an alarm feature. So you have to subtract, so rule out many. Secondly, if you have a uh, reason on self symptom, any, any, not in any patient. Now you have you can have reason on self symptoms in younger patients. I would say, okay, you can safely treat them. They rarely have cancer, especially less than 50. But make sure that you reassess them after your treatment and see whether there is a response or not. And if you have reason, uh, unintentional weight loss. Um, low, like weight loss means more than two kilograms within a month. A uh, lot of people, when you ask, they will say, okay, I have lost weight. But if you ask for detail, five kilograms over one or two years, that is not a significant weight. Significant weight loss means if you have lost more than two kilograms within one month, that is regarded as significant weight loss. Then if the patient is anemic, so very simple uh, thing to decide. Don't treat them. There is something. And if there is any bleeding for rectum or uh, rheumatemesis, obviously they will require investigation. Uh, also, during your examination, if you feel abdominal mass, obviously that patient will require uh, clean. But of course, by that time, it is already too advanced. So those are alarm features or red flag signs, very important to remember. Uh, so I would say this is uh, the best strategy for us. Uh, clinically assess them, and then you can decide uh, to treat them on their uh, depending on their uh, symptom, and then reassess. And if they, uh, if you think uh, they are not responded, it's reasonable to send them for uh, uh, investigation. But again, majority of them do not have any uh, organic illness. Uh, so I will, uh, in my case, of course, I will reassess, and then I will decide. Uh, to do surgery, but the endoscopy or not, but case by case, depending on. Right. So, how do you investigate endoscopy? Right. Uh, now, uh, if you do endoscopy, now you have listened to the, uh, the uh, Randy Mark lecture about endoscopy. Now, what usual practice in our country is to uh, 
report on white light, what is called the white light endoscopy. But it's ideally, gastritis cannot be uh, accurately diagnosed by white light endoscopy alone. So what we do is, as I mentioned, image enhancer, enhancement with or without magnification. So if you use image enhancement, that means you view the, uh, instead of white light, you are viewing the stomach mucosa under different type of light, especially like a narrow band and so on. So you will see a pattern like this, right? So you will see a microvascular structure. So uh, now there are various changes which are associated with uh, gastritis. And depending on uh, the severity of gastritis, you can grade into mild, moderate, or severe gastritis uh, by looking at this. And also, don't forget that you can actually identify if there is uh, uh, early cancer developing uh, these chronic gastritis. That is very, very, uh, 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 very accurate method. So there are various classifications like uh, NPA classification, JNET classification, and so on. So depending on that, then we will say, okay, this patient has gastritis, or this patient has early gastric cancer, and so on. So those are some of the recent advances in endoscopy. Then diagnosis of H. pylori. Well, if you do endoscopy, then there are a number of tests. We can do uh, rapid urease test or CVLO test. So this is how it's being done. So these are commercially available. Actually, you don't need to buy them. You can uh, make it uh, locally. We have been used to do that. Uh, so, so this is called a CLO test. That means Campylobacter-like organism. That is the old name given for this pylori. It's pylori name was given later. So we still call it CLO test. On the other hand, if you decide not to do endoscopy, that also can be possible. Uh, and still you want to see whether this patient is having chronic gastritis induced by H. pylori, which is a very small subgroup of patients. You have non-invasive tests, especially uh, urea breath test, right? That is not available in this country. Or you can do serology. But remember, serology can be positive IgG, especially if you have fast infection. Then PCR test card is also available, right? So once you re, uh, decide on uh, the spiral status, then of course you can undertake treatment. So usually if it is gastritis without any alarm symptoms or any other uh, organic illnesses, proton from inhibitors for four to six weeks and then you can reassess. Then I mentioned about the diet. Actually, they are, we usually don't recommend dietary restriction. Now a lot of people ask them to avoid chilies, fat and tea and coffee. Which is, they are nowadays, remember, uh, you must know this. We practice what is called evidence based medicine. Evidence based mean, mean, medicine means uh, you need to have uh, uh, evidence in the, in the form of randomized control or whatever the clinical trials. Actually, uh, there are very few studies done regarding the chilies, uh, and they have not shown any association with gastritis. Only thing is, it will increase the symptoms. But some people say chilies have a uh, protective effect because chili has uh, antioxidant properties. Same with the fat, it does not cause uh, uh, any uh, uh, gastritis, but it can cause aggravation of the symptoms. Uh, that's a different topic, especially functional. If you have functional bowel disorder, which is usually mistaken as chronic gastritis, they can have uh, uh, food intolerance or food aggravation. So we use uh, what is called the FODMAP diet for that sort of patient. And tea and coffee, again, there is actually no uh, relationship with it. Actually, tea is very good because it contains antioxidant. Coffee, on the other hand, sometimes it may be, uh, it may precipitate reflux of the diabetes if you have, uh, which is another cause of uh, uh, dyspeptic symptoms. So excessive drinking, better to avoid that. Then the lifestyle uh, modification, obviously stop smoking and avoid alcohol. And if you think the if you detect is violent, then treat violent treatment, that's the problem. So a little bit more about the diet and the gastritis. Actually, uh, there is a uh, relationship between chronic gastritis and H. pylori and postgenetics and dietary factors. Uh, so whether, what, whether you are going to develop gastritis or peptic culture or uh, the gastric cancer depends on this interaction between these two. Now, as I may, mentioned earlier, now in our country, so we do not have very 
very sort of sanitary condition, we still do not have much of uh, H. pylori infection. So maybe due to uh, genetic factors, which does not give us colonization of our stomach with H. pylori, that may be one of the explanations. So uh, when you tend to dietary, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, antioxidants are very helpful. They will prevent further damage to the gastric mucosa and it will protect against uh, chronic gastritis and also protect other gastric cancer. Then Eastern uh, Asian countries, especially Korea, Japan, China, they have very high soil diet, which can again uh, interfere with the gastric barrier and that will again predispose to uh, development of gastric cancer. That is one of the explanation that is given for the high incidence of gastric cancer among East Asian population. So, so much for that. So in conclusion, uh, we have to remember that these septic symptoms are very common, but they do not uh, have, all of them do not have organic cause, but you have to have uh, And please make sure that they don't have alarm symptoms or red flag signs. And unfortunately, sometimes patient who comes with persistent vomiting, uh, I have seen yesterday also one case, uh, they treat for gastritis, but uh, those those are there is one of the alarm symptoms, especially in a, a, a patient, older patient, persistent vomiting. So you can uh, adopt test or treat strategy, and if you need testing, uh, prefer please prefer them for further testing. So if you if you want to eradicate H. pylori, there is there are guidelines, right? So there is a it's pylori guideline, it's Asia Pacific guideline, especially for in this area. I can give you a copy if you want. So please follow the guidelines. Don't treat them without testing. That's part of the take home message. And I, as I mentioned earlier, give the correct dietary advice. Now you know that uh, what is actually you have some understanding about that. So please don't give wrong advice and make them ill again. Because uh, I mean, if dietary advice, Restrictions are not very easy to practice, and you should not unnecessarily impair the quality of the life of the patient. So remember that. So get rid of these, get rid of this uh, bits about that we advice. Okay, thank you very much. Any question? Right. Thank you very much, sir. That was Dr. Amal Priyant on the topic of uh, gastroitis. So, next lecture is by Dr. S. Handagala. Uh, so, he's logged in, I think.
So the next lecture is done by Dr. Sandagal, a consultant surgeon on the topic of discharging patients. Uh, so we'll join shortly. Right, we can see the slides, sir. Uh, just make it full screen and we'll move one or two slides. So, this moving, yeah, moving, sir. We can start. They have given the introduction. We can start. Sir. So, you need to unmute. Hello, can you hear now? Yes, sir. can hear. Right. Okay, hear. good morning to everybody. And I'm Dr. Handagal, one of the thoracic surgeons in uh, National Hospital of Respiratory Diseases, Sri Lanka, uh, previously called Chess Hospital Valisara. Uh, the lecture series uh, uh, given by the College of Surgeons uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. The topic given to me is discharging a patient. So this is a common topic that you all encounter as interns uh, in the day-to-day -day general uh, board setting, as well as in the clinic setting. Right. So we'll, uh, I don't have that many slides, you know, just the same things that you know as your medical student guess. So if we talk about the discharge settings, uh, first, it may be from the ward or maybe day treatment unit. And then we can talk of uh, discharging from the clinics. Uh, sometimes, you know, the patient may be, uh, although the surgical patient, they are uh, being discharged while in investigation phase or preparation for uh, surgery. Uh, then after completion of a planned treatment, probably, and then uh, transferring or referring a patient to another institution or specialty unit for further care. Or sometimes patient may be sent home or other centers for palliative or end of life care. So those, those who can't be cured, then we'll be referring to sort of uh, terminal care. So why ward discharges are important to a hospital? So firstly, to plan bed management because uh, then we can cater uh, the space for new elective and emergency admissions. And then we can make less waiting time for emergency department patients. You know, in our setting, of course, that's not a big problem, but you know, in, in developed countries, especially in the UK. So you must have heard in the news that some of the trauma patients, a and &E patients waiting for hours. You know, this topic is being discussed even in the parliament, you know, because the waiting time in the ETU, waiting for a bed in the hospital, the patients are kept in the sometimes ambulance for hours, not being seen by a doctor. You know, our setup is much better. You know, if a bad patient comes, by their setup, they take the patient in order. So sometimes some patients die in the ambulances or wait low hours, you know, increase in the morbidity, sometimes even mortality. 
So second point is hospital care is for patients who need a high level of medical attention. I mean, we should not be keeping patients and this is not a sort of an elderly home or a, uh, just a roof for those who don't have houses. This is for people who need high level of medical attention. So we should at some point dis 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 decide on whether we should dis discharge this patient from the ward for further care, either for home or some other, uh, say, lower level hospitals. So, and to keep a patient in the hospital is also expensive. And, and for most cases, I mean, most patients would, you know, experience the hospital or ward setup is uncomfortable. I mean, those who live in a street without a roof, may it may be a sort of a mansion for them in the ward. But for most of us, you know, living in a hospital ward is uncomfortable. So why we should not keep patients unnecessarily in a ward if the patient can be sent home. So that's common sense. So then also being in hospital also expose you to a possibility of other, say, infections sometimes. Unnecessary trouble, you know, the tick bone, sometimes, you know, you, you are being exposed to other, you know, diseases. So which is, which if you keep the patient for a longer time unnecessarily, the patients are prone again. How can we plan, how can we plan the discharge? So may even start before the admission for elective patients. You can tell the patient in the clinic setting that uh, your tentative time of the stay in the hospital is this much. So you should be able to go home, say, after five days or after a week. So most cases we can sort of prognosticate uh, and predict. And depending on daily status, decided on the normal ward rounds, you can decide to discharge. So, but that doesn't mean in the morning ward rounds, patient may be stable. By the time you finish the ward round clinic, you start writing your diagnosis card in the evening. But if the patient's status changes, say by four o'clock in the evening, so they should, you should inform your seniors uh, and you may review your decision to discharge, right? That's very important. And there were situations where morning ward round decided to discharge, but by evening patient bad, but still you continue to discharge and patient may go home and either readmit on the same night or may even die. You know? So you should you are the first officer in the board. So you should be conscious enough to review the patient status at, before actual discharge. And uh, discharge in the proper time reduces emergency readmissions. And you can decide whether the patient needs uh, simple, most cases, about 80% of the cases, is just a simple discharge, you know, just write in a diagnosis card and write some medication and give her a clinic pan. Those are simple discharge. And sometimes <clears throat> some patients need complex, complex discharges. For example, say you may need referral to some other center, you may, may need a MDT discussion, and then probably uh, a patient may need transfer to some other unit. Uh, so those are complex discharge or else those who don't have home, you have to, you know, identify a place to send the patient home sometimes, uh, maybe psychiatric patients. So those are complex discharges. And sometimes the medical legal cases, you know, you need, you know, special attention. Say a child comes after a rape case, you know, by own father would say, are you going to send the patient? back to the same house, you know, it's a vulnerable locality. So you, you need to discuss those uh, issues. Those are complex discharges. So then focus on individual patient needs, like I previously mentioned, the where to go. So then is there any family or friend support? And how about the transport? You, you may just push the patient out of the ward. How can the patient go out? And in fact, in, in the setting of Western countries, they even book an ambulance or book a taxi from hospital expense to send the patient home if there is nobody to pick the patient. And uh, need for continued care, such as physiotherapy or social workers, we have to arrange those, make uh, you know appropriate referrals. And then depending on the different conditions, uh, have sp uh, specific clinical criteria that the patient must meet before discharge, say, for example, say after abdominal surgery, so uh, say after chest tube insertion say after a lobectomy in the lung or after a isobagectomy. So what are you, you can have set sort of guidelines in your wards uh, with your senior support or consultant support and you, you can stick to those guidelines and uh, discharge the patient. And always you as most junior in the hospital, don't take decision, you want to discharge a patient 
always, if the consultant does the vote down, that's fine. If he's not coming in, in rare situations, you may even call or get your senior opinion before discharge. Because uh, if something happens when the patient discharge, your seniors may say, we didn't tell to discharge. HO has decided to discharge. So don't, uh, you know, you know, be in that situation. Always make a note that your senior advised to discharge because you are the most junior. And the health sector has become, you know, one of the uh, common, you know, newsmakers in the country now. So every day there is something with regard to health in the papers. So better take sort of practice defensive medicine. So don't take that risk. Always take your senior's opinion. And common criteria for discharge of a post-op patient. Usually these are uh, pain must be adequately controlled and no issue with regard to surgical wounds. And other medical conditions are adequately controlled. So maybe your wound is healed, but you know, blood sugar levels may be rising around 300, 400. You can't discharge a patient. You know, uh, you have done the hernia repair, but patient started hematemesis in the world. So you can't simply discharge because your primary condition is sorted. And probably sometimes completed IV medication, maybe antibiotics or maybe other uh, drugs. Especially important with regard to anticoagulants. Maybe patient is in on heparin in the ward or low molecular weight or unfractionated. Then you need to convert the patient into warfarin. So you need to make sure that his you know INR the, the prothrombin time level has reached adequate levels. And uh, before discharge, sometimes you know it's a risk to send the patient before uh, achieving certain uh, level of you know prescribed uh, INR level. And uh, and patients usually most of them should be relatively independent. Some say those who are sort of anime bedridden. But usually most patients walk or come in a wheelchair. So the those patients should be adequately independent for activities of daily living, like eating, drinking, bowel opening, those stuff we made to make sure, especially elderly people, you know, opening bowel is a crucial issue. And in Western countries, is about 10% of the cause of death is constipation, you know. So they are opening the bowel is important. So make sure they open bowel or you give something to open bowel uh, so that they are comfortable. So last point I have uh, mentioned to you. As in turn, how to plan a smooth discharge. So start writing your diagnosis card or discharge summary well before discharge when you have free time. Say if you have a free day, you are not in the theater, the other intern is in the theater. So if you are free, you can start, you know, you know, tentative discharge. So tomorrow this patient might go home. You can start uh, writing uh, those diagnosis cards early. That's a way to you sort of save time. Then your consultant seniors for specific needs. Consult your seniors for specific needs. So communicate early because sometimes you need to sort of arrange things like for say, if the patient discharge for a, after a CT scan date, so we have to make sure that proper date is taken and then discharge patient accordingly. And attend to specific needs of individual patients, like transport, continued care, I told you earlier, and inform the seniors of status uh, of the patient before discharge if the status changes. And speak to the patient as well as relatives if available regarding post-discharge plan. And if the, there's a language issue, always better to have an interpreter to tell the patient regarding post-discharge, uh, you know, course of action. Then instruct or supervise the nurses regarding checklist for discharge. Most patients, they have a checklist for discharge patient uh, to hand over their, you know, important the medical reports, those stuff, right? And it's better to have sheets of printed information whenever possible for different conditions, uh, if it's a busy ward. So need to educate the patient on medical condition at time of design. No, in a busy ward or busy clinic setting, you may not be able to. But whenever you get a chance, need to educate the patients as much as possible. And what kind of follow-up she or he would need, such as physical therapy and with regard to suture or clip removal and with regard to desin change and what medication need to be taken, including why, when, and how to take them and possible side effects to watch for, and what medical equipment he or she will need, and how to get it, and how to use it, and interpret results, 
And for example, if a diabetic patient goes home with a, a glucometer and we need, or somebody needs to be taught how to use and how to interpret, right? When and how or she or he will receive test results, and especially with regard to histology report, you need to instruct the patient to come to clinic or come to ward or come and collect it from the laboratory. You need to give specific instruction depending on your actual hospital setting because the different hospitals work in different systems. Uh, and then further pending procedures, like some patient may be on stents, like say JJ stands for say uric operations so when are you going to remove those so drain removal some patients may be discharged home with a drain institute and tracing the reports well those are very important because i have seen patients come in with an empyema you to infect a chest cavity with ghost towels two ghost towels inside the chest cavity for eight years so proper discharge instructions have not been given i don't know whether the patient was sort of lama or left against medical advice, patient came eight years later having two ghost towels in the chest cavity. So those things can happen if you don't carefully instruct the patient that there is something inside your body which is important to be removed. Those uh, details need to be given before discharge. So instructions with regard to food, drink and exercise and which activities you need to avoid. Some patient asks about exercise, you know, day to day, uh, stuff sometimes you know his usual job some patient may ask about their sexual life you know so you need to be ready to answer any question and uh, appropriately advise them then if you have information leaflets that's fine or general guidelines for common uh, surgical procedure i know some words uh, some units they have but but if you are a good house surgeon, you can formulate uh, good uh, discharge leaflets for different conditions uh, with the help of your seniors. And what he or she can expect at a new facility, if the patient being transferred to some other place, what the patient can expect with regard to pain, with regard to, say, condition of the, the patient, uh, those stuff. Then important phone numbers to call in the, either hospital with the extension number or uh, any other person, so physiotherapist or any department to call if there is a question. Uh, in fact, in our setting, the, the discharge patient, usually we don't discharge to general practitioner, but in UK and other developed countries, you, you send the discharge note or discharge summary to the, the GP or general practitioner of the patient's area as well. When, when, when you finalize the discharge, it will go to uh, the GP and the referring doctor as well. So, so those advice, the post of follow-up advices are there. The GP can have a look uh, on that discharge summary, right? And then instruction about when they should call or seek medical advice. So you can advise them common complications. So issues, you know, the red alarm signs, you know. So if this happens, for example, the common exam question is, you know, if you send a patient with a POP cast, if the patient there is severe pain in the distal extremity, ask the patient to either buy well or come to a closest, you know, medical facility to buy well the POP cast. So those stuff, you know, important red alarm signs, we need to tell the patient. Otherwise, they will just simply ignore. And days and times of your follow-up appointments and information about how to make appointments. Those information need to be given so that, you know, these days transports very difficult, you know, everything is costly now because of this economic downturn. So coming to a hospital by bus or price or taxi is very expensive. So we, we, we need to make sure that they, they, are, they are not unnecessary transport into the hospital. So we need to give specific advice uh, if possible most of the time. So how about these all the previously mentioned ones are the ward discharge. How about clinic discharge? I mean, you can't be following up all your ward patient in clinic eternally. So at some point, you need to discharge. Of course, few patients may remain in the clinic as sort of fixed deposits like, you know, they can't be discharged, need continued care of you, but most patients can be discharged. So always better to seek senior or consultant advice regarding clinic discharges because then patient sort of, you know, sort of left free, like, you know. So make sure that the history reports for red alert signs are documented on the diagnosis card or clinic books and records. 
And any further referrals you need to do, say, if your job is over, but need to be followed up, say, in the rehabilitation hospital or neurology clinic. So those follow up need to be well arranged. And advice what to do if similar clinical picture occurs. So if he's discharged from the clinic, probably he can't come back to the clinic. Sometimes you can discharge from the clinic saying if there is this particular sign, you come to the clinic. Otherwise, just go to the OPD. Don't come to clinic. So likewise, you need to give specific advice so that patient is not in trouble. What are the other aspects you need to think of at uh, uh, discharge of a patient? And recording proper diagnosis on the BHT <clears throat> as well as the diagnostic card. And check any medical legal formalities. So you must may have informed police, but police may not have seen. You may need, you know, JM or referrals. Uh, those stuff need to be checked before the patient is sent home. And sometimes some patients need vaccines. For example, the patient who has undergone, say, a splenectomy, uh, those patients may need, you know, vaccinations. Those need to be arranged. And then with regard to medical certificates, some patients need medicals, maybe the government medical, maybe private medicals. Those issues usually come to you. If the period is long, probably you may need consultants or senior signature as well. So the insurance forms, most of the time, you know, consultant has to sign and sometimes most consultant delegate it to the, the junior doctor to fill. Or let's make sure that you, you, you fill up the correct information. If you are ambiguous, poor patient is not going to get the insurance cover if you have written wrong stuff. And then sometimes they may ask for fitness certificates or sometimes a medical condemn, for example, to get, you know, ETF or EPF patients say, Dr. Matavadagran, Mama condemn. So they bring, you know, forms from uh, the labor department to sign. So obviously you can't sign those forms. These patients need to be put on the medical boards so that the consultant panel will dec decide on whether the patient is actually medically condemned. So fitness certificates and medical condemn forms are not your, your area. Always leave it to consultants and don't uh, be smart and fill those forms and uh, put in trouble yourself. And uh, you can ask the ward staff to so reserve BSGs if a future readmission is expected in near future. And in those times, some patients for short holidays were sent home, you know, without discharge. We call, we gave the patient uh, uh, sort of a holiday, like, you know. But nowadays, they don't recommend they ask to discharge a patient and readmit. Probably you better keep the old BHT, which can be attached to the new BHT. Otherwise, you need to write everything all together. So that's a good thing that you can do without sending the patients on leave for long term because some patients, you know, they have the BHT here, you send the patient on leave, they do all sort of record outside when you are discharged to society, you know, drug trafficking or Burugan or whatever, doing this, you know, robberies and all. But officially, he is in a inward patient, but patient physically is outside. So those are legal issues. So better not send the patient home on leave for long term. Say, to attend a funeral or something with your consultant advice, you can send if the patient's stable. Say, um, to get some other salary, gandhari, say, deed day ka sign karnari, wagi podi day ka For a small matter for a few hours, that's fine. For to go to a outside investigation, yeah, you can send the patient on leave, but not for loan. I don't advise to send the patient home on leave for long time. So what are the other tips for house officers? Uh, the time management, as I mentioned earlier, you can plan the discharge in and uh, a bit earlier without waiting for the last moment. So in some consultants may do discharges, uh, say vote rounds every two or three days a week. So that day there may be a lot of discharge. Some consultants won't allow discharges before seeing him. So, so many patients piled up, you know, say 20, 30 patients, endless writing cards. So, so if you expect these sort of setting, better to start writing discharges a bit earlier, right? Then uh, find time to advise patient. Discharge moment, say your word round time, you can give some simple advices, right? During morning, at your word round, at the time of discharge, 5 o'clock, if you start giving advices, so you may fed up, you know, you may not have even had your lunch, you know, sometimes. So that's not a time to give, you know, with a good sound mind to give advice. 
So better to give during your vote, vote rounds with your experience, uh, you can do that. And uh, keep in mind when you write the diagnosis card, uh, informative, but not exhaustive and irrelevant stuff. Uh, you, you write salient points only, right? And uh, operation notes, some consultant do their operation notes their own, sometimes written by some others. If those are not clear, better ask your seniors or consultant without writing, you know, Borulian uh, what you don't know. Or else you take a photocopy of your operation notes and then attach it to the diagnosis card and write the name of the operation only. And legible writing is very important because somebody, say after 10 years, somebody may be referring. By the time you become a consultant, they, the same card will come to you where you can't read. So now most hospitals, they have, you know, printers and computers. Then if you have time and discharge summary, you can print actually. And, uh, and save a copy in the system as well, if you can do. Right. Uh, that's and, and some tips. I know you must have been uh, aware of these discharges during your, your last professorial year's appointment. Then if there's any question, I can ask you some question. There are a few more minutes. Roshan? Yes, sir. Somebody has switched on their mic. Sorry. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, the conference lecture on discharging patients. That was Dr. Is uh, on the Gala consultant surgeon at National Hospital Colombo. So, so next up is another important topic by Burns, done by Dr. Gayan Nekanayaka, consultant plastic surgeon in National Hospital Colombo. So, if you'll have a few minutes until the Dr. Gayan starts, we can answer questions. So, you can use the chat box to unmute yourselves. Thank you, sir, once again. Okay, Roshan. Please keep your mics muted during the lecture. If you'll have only a question, please unmute yourselves. Not you know, ethical or not nice to unmute yourselves. So we can see, we need to make it full screen, sir. We'll do. I'll just give him, give me a few seconds. I'm just. Uh... Yes, it's moving. It's okay. Yeah.
Good afternoon again. Uh, can you all hear me? Um, so this is uh, this is about severe burns because um, I know that uh, you might you might be uh, uh, wondering why we have shifted because uh, there was a lecture that was done previously. So I'm just going to fill uh, this particular period. Uh, and this was a 14 year old boy um, who came to. Uh, Kuru Nagala when I was working there. And um, the whole, you need to understand the whole context of a burn. So this is one of the good examples that I, I take frequently. Um, so this is a 14 year old boy who has fallen on a heater, water heater. You can see the water heater marks, coils on the face uh, and it's gone deep and it's a full thickness burn. Can you see the faces? Uh, nearly cooked. Uh, so it's the, almost down to the uh, bone. Uh, the burn is down to the bone. And uh, this is a relatively uh, smaller percentage, but it's a very important, um, uh, very important uh, area that we have. All, all our five senses are located here. So it's um, eyes, nose, lips, ears, and the facial entire personality is on a face. So now uh, the problems of this patient is, um, I will just list out the problems. Now he will have problems in uh, you know, uh, surviving this burn due to sepsis and you know, you can have meningitis and all those things and see oil and sepsis. If he, if he survives, he's going to miss a lot of schooling. And um, even if we um, get the reconstruction going, it, once we skin graft the face, it's never going to look normal. It's a very abnormal face to have, scarred face. And he's not going to get uh, very, become very popular in the school. And, you know, everybody's going to say, you know, you know it's like that. You know? So everybody will have issues looking at him. It's not the problem with this boy. It's a problem with others, uh, how the other's mentality works. So they'll be actually very... Uh, we don't like to see unpleasant things. So this is uh, unpleasant. So we will be rejecting this boy. So the kids will be rejecting. So he will have a very difficult time ahead in the school. And uh, there is not, it's not, it's no brainer to say that, you know, this is just, uh, uh, he's not going to do well in exams and, you know, academically he's not going to become a brilliant uh, student. Uh, this uh, school, missing school and also the psychological impact of this burn. And even if he uh, finally finishes school and you know gets out of the school, you do you think that uh, anyone will give their daughter to this guy you know, in marriage and you know finding a girlfriend or you know one to have a partner in life will be an amazingly difficult task for this chap. And um, even if he finds someone who is supposing say a blind girl like a blind girl wants to marry him, so then he get married and have kids, um, the the child will not like. To take his father to school. So entire life is miserable. He won't find a good decent job because people don't like his appearance. So simple burn can ruin the entire life. They, even if they, if the six, simply because when a burn is um, there, it's just a normal person with an injury of the skin. But the no, one, if they survive the burn, then they will go on to live the normal life expectancy. So, so the entire life will be a miserable one. Now, the uh, this is an important slide. If you can take some snapshots out of this, that is amazing because this is what you will need to uh, see and do during your um, uh, uh, the entire emergency management. So this is a simplified version of the uh, 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 the simplified version of um, what you need to do. Okay, and. Um, The other important thing aspect is that uh, once we, uh, the burns incidence, there, there's an enormous uh, void in uh, um, problems uh, of non-availability of data, proper data to have um, any planning going on in the country. I'm heading the burns unit at the moment, but we have an imme um, immense amount of difficulty um, faced by us. So there's a lot of, um, uh, fund allocation issues. There's no real uh, 
real solid data to support our system. And uh, the cost is unbearable. Even if one of us gets a burn, it's not going. You are not going to be able, able, able to afford burn treatment in uh, private sector. So let alone the government sector. Government sector is also uh, it's not cheap. If somebody has to pay, so the payment is done by the people of this country. So it's amazingly expensive endeavor, and um, the very difficult to. Uh, adhere to protocols because sometimes you have this and sometimes you don't have this so you can't uh, have a concrete uh, solid protocol driven treatment and lot of lot of uh, untrained personnel treating burns so they are not trained to look after some of the big burns and they try to do wound debridement and you know this doesn't really work burn burn debridement this does not does not work it's a burn excision so it doesn't work and survival is not guaranteed uh, despite having adequate experts. So now the problem is now it was, uh, it was used, it used to be accident, uh, the accidental burns are, um, are common, but self-immolation, so self-inflected burns are more common among severe burns. Now it used to be females that are very, um, we had a lot of females coming with uh, self-immolations. Now it's the other way. The males are coming. With, my ward is filled with males who are uh, who have uh, tried to commit suicide by uh, uh, you know uh, by um, uh, setting themselves on fire. In, now there is another important thing about uh, this. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> We are lucky and the world had this year in every little look at the current noni kiela. A hem of in the villa water, Alabula novi, Natara villa, Bimutiga villa, Peril in noni. A pipero a caramada. Hurry. Then, and the world to Guinea Villuna kila hitan. Then, then number, number thin. He lunged a Bimutiga win. Una guinea naracha kragan at the king moon of a hagan. Eat a passe, guinea nivinaka, Bima Peril in noni. Pulangadin <laughs> Right, that was a fire safety uh, video that we have done. But uh, this important thing is the technique of stop drop roll is very important. That at least you guys know if you if you know how to do it, then that's. That's one uh, one uh, one advantage of doing a proper stop, drop, and roll. And we do uh, cool the burn areas up to three hours, minimum of twenty minutes. So remember that; those are important things. Now let us talk about some uh, theoretical aspect of burns. Now this is called burn wounds model, uh, and they I have taught this uh, in uh, medical student days for some other batches. And there's zone of coagulation, zone of stasis, and also zone of hyperemia. So that's uh, how it's uh, divided into this. So, but uh, burn is something like this. You have, it's a mixed depth thing. You don't have single depth. So it's a, uh, can you see the center of is uh, burned badly, then uh, up to periphery, you get a less severe burn. And uh, now this depth changes like this central center to the periphery and initially for about three to four days the you can't actually uh, give the depth accurate depth assessment up to uh, can go up to four days now you it changes with the adequacy of first aid and adequacy of resuscitation now this is something going back to the physiology days now this is a uh, this is talking about starling forces where you um, where we you can see how the edema um, edema uh, happens now. The, there are two things that happens. Uh, the 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 what we call uh, the albumin leak 
colloid osmotic pressure is reduces because the albumin leaks into the tissues and also there is a, there is a dragging force outside so which is called colloid interstitial fluid uh, colloid uh, osmotic pressure where the uh, uh, the um, in, interstitial uh, area has suction power which which sucks out uh, fluid from blood vessels so this increases in burn because the quaternary structure of the um, the the protein molecules in the basement um, uh, it becomes uh, opened up and the then there's lot lot of spaces for uh, fluid to accumulate so there is going to be a lot of edema now this is what this is a uh, something in nutshell so they get localized or generalized edema when it's generalized edema they can go into hypovolemic shock which we call the burn shock and it needs to be treated otherwise it's going to become fatal now this is same as most of the shock. Uh, this is the shock um, shock syndrome where the there are the uh, suppression of anabolic hormones, secretion of stress hormones. There's a shock response of the body, and there are other effects on the body: uh, cardiac suppression, respiratory distress syndrome, immune dysfunction, loss of blood integrity, and uh, there is um, and also um, there will be. Uh, loss of integrity causing bacteria and also uh, bacteria translocation which can cause infection uh, emergency examination and treatment is also important where you have three categories of person patients where they can be only a burn sometimes they can you know so the, it can be due to uh, birds masking other injuries also burns present with other uh, no, something that is separate. So they can happen all three ways. Now, usually these patients, unconscious, intubated, psychotic patients are difficult because they will not talk to you. It's very difficult to get a good history. So in a nutshell, what we'll do is uh, stop, drop and roll and water for cooling. These are first aid that are done outside the primary care institute. So if it is when the patient comes to the uh, care institute, you have to immediately do start the primary survey. Don't go into first aid. So first aid is reserved for uh, for outside hospital as well as once the primary survey is done. And only you can go for first aid in a hospital. So can you see that first aid is here? Uh, it's effective up to three hours from the burn. And you can get the primary survey here and the secondary survey uh, there. And also there is something in between what we call fat between primary survey and secondary survey. F-A-T-T means fluid analgesia tests uh, and tubes. Now primary survey is something like this. AI management, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. Now that is what we assess. What we do is we uh, control cervical spine, so we supplement with oxygen, we do the hemorrhage control, and, and sometimes we have to assess the uh, um, assess, uh, assess and um, do certain things with um, uh, pupils. We have to check the pupils and also exposure at the exposure level. The environmental control is very important. That means the patient has to be kept warm. Now, when you get a patient like this in the airway and the ABC, the patient is talking nicely, but uh, in few hours' time, it can turn up to be something like this. It's totally dematous and very, very difficult to intubate. And also, very uh, it's critically, they are going to become critically ill. Um, so, we use, we recommend two white book annually, preferably two unburned tissue. Remember that you should not. Uh, once you put the cannula, you have to take blood for uh, these tests and also to do some cross-matching if something needs. So immediately start Ringer's lactate, two units from the two lines. Now the disability, of course, we have to uh, check check the alert, whether the patient is alert, like AVPU is the preferred choice for um, the patient's neurological status. When we talk about exposure and external environment, so we talk about head to toe um, and expose part by part, cover the rest of the body, keep the patient warm and also finally 
you have to do a log roll to check the back of the patient. So now how to assess the burn surface area, we use the rule of nine or use the palm aspect of the entire hand as of the patient as a 1% of the, his body surface area. So we calculate the burn surface area using these two methods. Now this is a, this is a chart how the age variation uh, causes um, the percentage to shift. When they are born, if the head shape is roughly about two times the edge, uh, the normal shape, now size. Uh, so then it, every, every year, 1% moves to the lower limb. So finally ending up with 9% of face and also head, head and also two limbs also getting nine, point, um, another 4.5 and 4.5. So which is, um, sorry, uh, four and a four. That means you get um, another four added to each limb. There's another one percent that is that goes to the perineum. Now FATT is a very important thing where you start uh, when you start fluid. Now you cal you calculate a dose of fluid, and then you do analgesics and also uh, tests that you can you need to uh, for that patient to exclude any uh, radiological. Uh, radiological de detectable uh, issues where the cervical spine uh, and also uh, abdomen, um, those things. So then the last thing is the tube that, you know, you have to put a, a urinary catheter, central line, and sometimes you know, ET tubes, and those are things that we consider as tubes. Now, this is how we pro provide fluid for these patients. Uh, fluids usually it's three to four milliliters and uh, multiplied by the weight of the patient and the burn surface area. We also call it total burn surface area, TBSA. So in children, it's a bit difficult, different. Uh, again, uh, we might need to give some maintenance fluid, which is in 5% uh, dextrose plus uh, potassium chloride in, uh, in, in half normal area. So this is half normal. Is, uh, usually more renal friendly. That's the reason that we give uh, uh, this one in, is actually giving uh, maintenance uh, the fluid. So maintenance fluid is different thing. Now we have to calculate 100 ml for up to 10 kilogram, 50 ml for 10 to 20, and 20 milligram kilogram for each gram over 20 kilogram. So that is how, uh, so that is how, we discuss the uh, maintenance dose of the uh, patient. So maintenance is usually dextrose, say dextrose potassium, say that. Now analgesics, we generally trust morphine. So this is the dose, and you calculate the total dose. Give till the patient says, "Okay, I'm now I'm pain free because you don't get in respiratory arrest." That if you give morphine to a patient who is already in severe pain. Now, in, in uh, tests, of course, many hospitals do not have an extra department inside the resuscitation room. I'm not talking about the accident service, but inside the resuscitation room. If you have that, you are lucky. Um, but uh, we have uh, what is a bit more uh, uh, ad advanced scanning system it's called uh, fast scan, where you scan the uh, area, uh, areas of concern in the abdomen and chest mainly, and pelvis. Um, sorry. Now, tubes, of course, you're in a catheter, nasogastric tube. It's an important thing, it's a new naso, uh, nasogastric tube because um, uh, the problem of uh, uh, having a nasogastric tube is that uh, it, it just uh, decompresses the stomach as well as you can start early feeding of these patients because they are very, um, they feel very. Uh, Upset because uh, they are the, the about the burn and they, they will be depressed. They will not eat uh, or drink adequately to get the healing going on. Now this is how we measure, uh, monitor these patients: uh, the color, pulse oximetry, respiratory rate, urine output. So most important thing is the urine output hourly. Urine output thing is the most important thing. Now we have come to the end of the primary survey and also the fat between primary survey and secondary survey. And then we move back to the 
primary cervix, very quick round, airway breathing circulation, deficit and exposure. We don't need to do the exposure again, but uh, first ABC can be done. Uh, sometimes the ABCD can be done quickly to uh, check on the, um, the, uh, uh, the patient, whether the patient has deteriorated after primary cervix. Now, so these are the conditions that you might need to discuss with seniors about intubation indications and also the whether there is compartment in uh, impending compartment syndrome, whether we need to do something acutely or uh, surgically for those some other patients. Now, secondary survey is something very comprehensive. It's a head to toe examination. And uh, after life threatening condition have been excluded, you have to do a very thorough examination. Now, the history you take, like called ample history, and you record all what the patient says. Don't worry, the patient might be sometimes not telling the truth. That is just to protect the family most of the time. So they, they, they say very weird things. When the light is on, the kupina uh, fell on the head. The, when you ask whether the lights are on, the news is on. So there's some. Everybody was watching TV. I I went to the kitchen and suddenly the thing fell on my head and I got burned. So it's very unnatural story. But you are not going to uh, sh shout at them for telling uh, no, not telling the truth. And also you are not going going to um, be. Um, uh, you are not going to uh, scold the patient just because the patient is not telling, giving you the correct version of the history. A head to toe examination is a must, and you can actually do a quick survey in most of the patients um, um, because uh, the sometimes you might miss some of the minor injuries, or sometimes you need to remove uh, pressure garments. Uh, for compression uh, garments that are compressing or jewelry that needs to be removed at this this particular time. Now, important thing is that you keep records and consider con uh, consent issues, and also uh, you need to um, uh, give a tetanus prophylaxis because um, the burns are supposed to be uh, a high risk factor for developing gas gangrene and. Uh, uh, the spores uh, and uh, those uh, tetanus, uh, tetanus, talk, tetanus, uh, tetanus of patient on gas gangrene. Sorry, it's tetanus. They are very prone to develop tetanus, so um, so they should get a booster dose or a um, actual uh, uh, a, uh, the prophylaxis for uh, tetanus. Now we will go back to the uh, uh, re-evaluation because you know this burn can burns are I told you they are dynamic they can uh, become bad at, and they can get erected. They, so sometimes you find patients dying on beds uh, without knowledge of anyone in the ward because sometimes they just drown in their own fluid if you give too much fluid and sometimes you uh, they see the airway getting swollen and. Uh, Breathing becomes problematic and they might die with this or um, so, yeah. Now, this important thing about dying patient is very important. Now, if, if you supposing it's a 95% burn coming to your unit and the patient requests you to send, doctor, can you send this send this patient to National Hospital where, where you know, the, the big hot shot is working, where you can, uh, can you send this uh, patient to be saved by the big shot? Uh, uh, which is me, by the way, but uh, uh, I mean, then there's a problem now whether this patient is 90% burn, uh, is he going to salvage this burn patient and become a world hero or something all of a sudden? No, I, I'm not a hero. I'm just uh, just an ordinary plastic surgeon who loves to treat burns and also the other things like, you know, everything from aesthetic surgeries to craniofacial surgeries to general surgery, so general plastic surgery. So the problem of um, dying patient, when you are under stress now, especially you're an intern officer, you will be assaulted if you sometimes if you if you don't if you don't give the correct decision. So the correct decision is not to antagonize these patients, no relatives, 
and because sometimes this is a mother who has a mother of a child who has put, you know, got depression and the husband is beating her or something and then set herself on fire brought to the hospital with face husband he is feeling guilty a relative feeling guilty everybody wants to salvage this patient uh, you know it, it, they won't accept that uh, uh, idea of dying patient so this is a very tricky situation how what would you do in this situation because then you can't talk to your boss because boss also doesn't cannot do anything about it and you can't be just uh, ignoring the relatives and uh, doing things and you can't be transferring them also there's no way that you will accept those patients because it's definitely against the good intention of um, you know good intention or, or also the patient uh, patient might die on the way because their fluid needs are immensely high and uh, there's no point you even putting uh, this this sort of <laughs> sorry somebody is um, somebody is very excited about something um, which is more more exciting than probably this lecture but anyway these the uh, when you get you will be excited you will uh, feel the excitement if 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 somebody uh, comes and uh, threatens you to kill you if you don't transfer this patient and uh, how to deal with this patient now the problem is now you need to talk, you need to contact the receiving end now i'll talk i'll share with you what are the units that are actually at the moment uh, looking after burns burns <laughs> patient uh, udesh would you mind uh, switching off your mic microphone thank you um yeah now what you do is that you need to take a call to the burns unit and tell in front of the patient's relatives that if uh, take a video call it's not doesn't matter and uh, first talk to the doctor say that uh, the please explain this to the uh, relative that why this patient should not be transferred and uh, we'll have to ta uh, we'll have to give sense to them because uh, in uh, on the on the ambulance it's very difficult to give fluid then you know measure fluid so hourly rate is very difficult to do those things the fluid resuscitation is the biggest hurdle and you give them some sort of a scientific expression why we are not and if that fails then the burns unit mo have to uh, intervene and tell this uh, this is not going to work like this so okay so we are going to move quickly because um, Our next lecturer will be very uh, will be there. So unstable airway never uh, you know never intubate a patient uh, unstable airway if the patient is about ninety percent burn. So these are uh, these are palliative cases. So just palliation is the most important thing. Uh, counseling of the relatives is very important. So the but others if somebody is um, uh, unstable don't transfer those patients unstable patients uh, without. um without uh, talking to us the burns unit now these are indications of course these are and you need to be aware of something called carbon monoxide poisoning and cyanide poisoning where the carbon monoxide of course you know how it is produced in a enclosed space and when you get plastic uh, uh, things in the room burning you get uh, carbon uh, sorry cyanide poisoning also happening so this is what's going to happen if the carbon monoxide levels go up and this is uh, these are the types of burns so epidermal burns heal within 7 days and superficial dermal burns heal within about 14 days and they have they usually have blisters mid dermal burns they regenerate but very difficult to um, uh, get a good recovery of entire uh, the some potential of regeneration but it usually end up getting some parts getting graft so can you see the center part is sub uh, mid dermal and deep dermal burns of course there is no way it's not going to survive so you might need to graft debride uh, so the burn excise the burn and graft it uh, as as soon as the patient is suitable of course full thickness burns might need a flap so it needs to be talked to the it needs to be discussed with the plastic surgeon um early fairly early like this case now burns change with time you see what has happened the initial burn has changed the 
picture and now it's shriveled up and sometimes it's healing. Now this is a quick guide to diagnosing depth of the burn. And this is the target urine output you need to take, uh, you know, be aware of. And you have underhydration, overhydration, and also myoglobin urea. Now the burn unit, burns wound management, this is called a burn scrub. You take the person into the theater and scrub, the, scrub all the dead tissue and put a temporary dressing or a permanent dressing if it is a superficial mark. These are very deep burns. Can you see how deep they are? They are almost white. Now this slide is again very important. This slide is available at slapras.com. If somebody has not uh, got the uh, website, you just go to the website uh, slapras, S-L, uh, S-L-A-P-R-A-S, slapras.com, right? All right, this is how you do it. Clean with saline and then you can go into, um, right. How to manage when depersing degree of prep. So, yeah, that's what say. Now, in, initial uh, initial plan is usually. Um, now, you need to talk about um, the uh, wash wash the wound with clean water and then cover it uh, plastic clean. So, so usually superficial burns heal spontaneously. You the what you do is to allow the spontaneous healing. So you don't have to change the dressing daily. Uh, so you have to do uh, what is uh, silver sulfur diacin is the dressing of choice. You apply silver sulfur diacin on a serial gauze piece and just put on the wound. Once you scrub the burn out, so under general anesthesia. So this can be changed every other day. Uh, then you can actually um, uh, normal saline cannot be used. You do not use more normal saline because it increases. Uh, uh, increases sodium outside the body and uh, it can go into uh, more and more edema as well as they can have very uh, resistant hypernatremia so they can die with that so only ringer's lactate ringer's lactate is freely available if you it is not available that is a crime and you have to actually report to the director that this is not available patients are uh, patients should not be given saline um, uh, because that is con we don't we don't endorse it at all. So yeah. So these are the things that you need to refer early, and this is how you do it. So primary survey, secondary survey, tubes, analgesic first aid, secondary survey, then primary wound care, and contact the plus close pass surgical unit and referral as a outpatient clinic. So I'm just going to stop there, and these are the current plastic surgery units available. So yeah. So this number used to work. Now it's not working. You can, this is my email. You can email me. And also, if you go to slapcross.com, you will have all these details in a written form in a very concise manner. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, Mira is there. Mira is going to start the abdomen trauma symposium. I'm afraid in the middle of the trauma symposium, there will be some other lectures also. Over to you, Mira. Right. Thank you, Gayan. Uh... You can share now. Great. <clears throat> can you see the screen now? Yes, I can, can see. You need to make it full screen. Right, okay. Okay now? Yes, sir. Right, right. Okay. 
so i am going to talk on uh, introduction to the trauma and uh, discussing the abdomen and pelvic trauma so i heard uh, uh, dr gayan was touching the some areas of initial assessment so any any uh, the type of trauma you need to access assess with the according to the atls principle uh, so uh, during my introduction uh, part of this lecture i am going to touch and uh, re emphasize the atls principle you should always adhere whenever whatever the kind of trauma is being managed there will be slight deviations to these principles but you have to adhere to these principles that is world accepted uh, uh, approach to managing trauma so what do you mean by initial assessment as a house officer you uh, need to all of you need to work uh, in the emergency department and you will be part of uh, the team uh, managing a trauma so you have to apply these principles uh, and manage so what do you mean by initial assessment so it is management of critically injured patients from admission to emergency department until definitive care is undertaken so if you hear the you are getting some patient from accident nearby incident and you start preparing the required resources instruments and preparation for to manage that patient and once the patient comes you start with the primary survey and after the primary survey uh, the you go into the secondary survey and once the secondary survey is finished and uh, you come to the come to know all the injuries patient is having and the, you can plan the definitive treatment for each injury throughout this process reevaluation is must because trauma patient is dynamic and continuously changing if you reevaluate only you can detect improvement in the intervention you made and the improvement with the, your resuscitations or with the patient deteriorating whether you have missed something you need to uh, the correct those things and there are things called adjuncts that will help you to uh, sometimes make the diagnosis sometimes uh, to see the progress or improvements or monitor so adjuncts also you have to use during trauma management what is primary survey this is the first part you do in a trauma patient after admission what do you mean by primary survey when i ask from medical students come for appointments they say a b c d primary survey is a b c d but that is not the complete answer the primary survey is identifying immediate life threatening conditions and initiating resuscitation to save from trauma so the key word is immediately life threatening conditions therefore you need to quickly identify whether this patient is having any immediate danger to life in other words immediate life threatening condition in your patient and try to resuscitate quickly in order to save the patient so that process is called primary survey during this process it is not a comprehensive one you have to focus and quickly perform and quickly identify and quickly act then only certain life threatening emergencies can be uh, resuscitated and save the patient so what are the principles in all in primary survey these principles means whenever wherever you practice in the world the 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 these principles are same do you have to follow the abcd priority vertical or horizontal approach 
That means you have to start from A always and proceed to B, C, D, E. That priority is uh, arranged because airway injured patients are likely to die more quickly than the patient with breathing problems. Patients with breathing problems likely to die more quickly than the patient with circulatory problems. Therefore, the highest priority given should be to airway problem, then the breathing problem, then the circulatory problem, then disability and exposure. Therefore, if you are the only person at a particular institution, so you have to follow A, B, C, D from A, B, C, D approach, that is vertical. But supposing you are in a tertiary care unit, the, the well-established, uh, the big hospital, uh, you have a bigger team, then the one or more components of this ABC can be attended at the same time while still giving the, this priority. So that is called horizontal approach. And this, during this primary survey, when you detect a problem, when you detect a patient is having a, some life-threatening problem, maybe hypotension, maybe hypoxia, you have to immediately act to find what it is, why it is, and start resuscitation measures. If it is for hypotension, you have to uh, the control any controllable bleeding external and start IV drip, crystalloid immediately. And then transfusion or blood transfusion as necessary and further control measures as necessary. That's the example. Similarly, if for hypoxia, you have to identify why the patient is hypoxic and start the measures, whether the patient need intubation, whether the patient need uh, secretion, su sucking out secretion, or in body removal, or intubation, or so tracheostomy, or uh, the IC tube insertion. So you have to act quickly then and there. You can't wait. I will come to that point later, or I will manage that later. You can't say like that because the, these are immediate life threatening conditions you have to manage then and there. At any point of time, if you see the patient is deteriorating, you have to go back to the A again and come back. Supposing you are managing the patient uh, or you are assessing disability, GCS. During that process, suddenly patient's blood pressure drops or saturation drops. So you quickly go to the airway assessment and B, C, D like that. You come again to see whether anything went wrong, any problem with the, the previous steps you have taken. And you should not be doing time-taking investigation, like particularly the various views of X-rays, limb X-rays for the fractures and the, uh, the limb X-rays, and no CT scan or contrast studies during primary only uh, permissible radiological investigations, chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, and a fast scan. That is to save time for life uh, to attend the life-saving procedures. And uh, but while gaining important information with regard to the life-threatening conditions. So. As I mentioned, primary survey priorities A, B, C, D, E. I hope you all know this, what this means. During the airway, what are the things you will be doing? Chin lift, jaw thrust maneuver, open the mouth and suck any secretion, remove any porin bodies. You can put the oropharyngeal airway and oxygenate tambu bag. Uh, and uh, if needed, you can intubate and make sure all during all these maneuvers, you maintain inline mobilization of neck. And at the end of the intubation procedures, make sure you secure the cervical spine with a collar. 
what about the breathing so once you manage the airway but if the patient may be hypoxic saturation low so the breathing problem there may be breathing problem and you can identify most of the life threatening breathing problems from clinically inspection bruise or wounds in the chest and palpating trachea with the central or deviated chest wall crepitus percussion resonant total and you can take the chest x ray by all those measures you can diagnose most of the immediate life threatening conditions massive hemothorax tension pneumothorax uh, the failed chest tracheobronchial injuries and open pneumothorax right and all those conditions so most chest injuries can be managed with the ic tube so uh, you should be well versed with the procedure how to prepare and perform get exposure try to get exposure and try to perform if if you have if you get the chance um, and uh, if you don't know try to get the cni help early to insert the chest tube during the circulation so it is during this circulate uh, assessment you have to mainly assess uh, the sources of bleeding first check the bp and pulse and the start resuscitation with the pistoloid using two white bow cannuli 14 gauge or and uh, 18 gauge or less usual causes of hypertension uh, can be given as one on the floor and four more one on the floor means external bleeding external wounds four more means the four major areas that can cause heavy bleeding chest cavity abdomen cavity pelvic cavity and the lone bones within the muscle bulk so you have to look for those areas in order to uh, find the cause for the hypertension in addition if you don't find consider whether it's a tamponade or a spinal injury <laughs> so what are the bleeding control measures if there is an external wound you can put the local pressure and pack with the gauze any cavitatory wounds if you apply pelvic binder that will control the bleeding from pelvis if the patient has fractures by splinting itself can reduce some bleeding and start pistoloid normal saline ringers lactate and don't exceed more than 1 liter in trauma patient try to get the blood transfusion early and in certain patient you may decide to give tranexamic acid depending on the nature of the injuries and the, the likelihood of blood loss initially 500 mg then as a bolus and all the time you are making this resuscitation warm the patient with a blanket warm the fluids pistoloid and blood because the the normal temperature in the patient is very important uh, for normal normal coagulation function if the patient has normal coagulation function it will uh, uh, clot the bleeding and helps to uh, control the bleeding and during the circulation you mainly doing uh, some x rays chest x ray pelvic x ray to see whether the, the the pelvic fracture or the any hemothorax the fast scan is very important uh, to detect any intra intraabdominal bleeding or cardiac tamponade some patient may need laparotomy some patient may need thoracotomy to control the bleeding 
then you come to the disability assessment you start assessing the conscious level use in the glasgow coma scale why do you decide glasgow coma scale uh, it determines the management 13 to 14 mild head injury 8 to 12 moderate head injury below it severe head injury all severe head injury patients need intubations and they check for the pupils and the neurology so you have to remember the glasgow's coma scale because you need to document in each patient and uh, even before transporting uh, and the, for monitoring purpose to see whether patient gaining consciousness or losing consciousness or deteriorating. <coughs> exposure. So during this uh, exposure, you look for all the injuries, remove the all uh, the dressers to see whether any important or significant injury missed, like openings of uh, the penetrating injuries to the chest, abdomen area, or external bleeding. You can detect by exposing all the, uh, the all the body. And the moment you had the look, cover with the blanket to avoid the hypothermia. Make the room temperature as normal so don't uh, use the ac machines with low temperatures so the room temperature room uh, the normal temperature should be the ideal to optimize coagulation right as i mentioned earlier all this time during the the the, the primary survey re constant revolution should be there and then only you can detect deterioration or improvement of patients. And what are the primary survey adjuncts? ECG, pulse oximeter, ABG, and urinary and gastric catheters. So try to use these things and the chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, all those things. And with that, you can have additional information, additional information with regard to the diagnosis and, and the resuscitation status. Urinary catheter, given the urine volume, uh, is a good measure of resuscitation of the circulation. Pulse oximeter is a good measure of resuscitation of airway problem or breathing problem. ABG, again, good measure of uh, the oxygenation. ECG can indicate any arrhythmias or uh, cardiac dysfunctions. Then what is secondary survey? If you have a second primary survey, uh, there should be a secondary survey as well. Why do you need secondary survey? During the primary survey, uh, you are not completely focusing each and every injury because in the primary survey, you focus only on immediate life-threatening injuries. But for the patient, however minor, uh, the, all injuries are important. Maybe a uh, small crack in the phalanx or a small laceration in the body. All those needs to be cared properly. In, a, in order to get the, uh, the good outcome. So you have to detect all the injury. Therefore, complete assessment of the trauma patient is needed to detect missed or subtle injuries. That process is called secondary survey. How to perform secondary survey? Again, revisit the mechanism, history. Take the ample history. And the, the, from the mechanism, you can predict the certain injuries, injury patterns. Examination should be thorough. 
front, front to back, head to toe. And you should start secondary survey assessment only when primary survey is completed and the, uh, the vitals, vitals are stable or acceptable. It doesn't mean patient has uh, regained the back to normal. It may not be normal, but acceptable improvements or stable values. What do you mean by ample history, allergy, medication, past history, last meal, events preceding to trauma? That is most important. From that, you can judge or have a degree of suspicion with regard to the possibility of injuries. Supposing somebody get a blow to epigastric area, what are the things possible, injuries possible? What are the anatomical structures in the epigastric area? You can get stomach, duodenum, pancreas in that region. So the pancreatic trauma, duodenal rupture can happen. So unless you have high degree of suspicion, sometimes initially these injuries may be missed. Urgence to secondary survey. So certain investigations are done dur during the secondary survey. Usually these investigations are time taking. CT scan, ultrasound, many ultrasound scans except fast scan, contrast studies, urethrograms, angiograms, endoscope, all those things. And once you get the, all the list of injuries, you can plan the definitive care. Definitive care does not necessarily mean it's going to be a surgery, no. Sometimes patient may have liver injury, splenic injury, but you are not going to operate. You can manage conservatively with good monitoring of the bleeding and resuscitation. As long as patient is uh, vitals are stable. So you may get the patient into the ICU or HDU for good monitoring. Sometimes you may have to decide whether you need to transfer to, to the another unit if you don't have a expertise or resources. So during transfer, they try to minimize delay and continuously use monitoring, continuous use resuscitation and make sure you properly communicate before sending the patients with the receiving end and uh, the, try to document everything and hand over those documentations with the transfer form. So those are very important. Talking with the receiving end, informing prior informing and the documenting and minimizing delay and the continuous monitoring and continuous resuscitation during the transfer. Right. So I will touch on the abdominal and pelvic areas. So I mentioned the abdominal and pelvic injuries are looked mainly during circulation because the many organs in the abdomen and pelvis are injured, uh, causing circulatory problems. So again, bruises, imprint abrasions should be noted in the uh, seat belt signs, uh, the bicycle handle signs, and any open wounds should be noted on inspection. Tend areas guarding suggestive of peritonitis should be noted. Focus assessment sonography for trauma. The fast scan should be done during 
the circulatory assessment. That is the tool, uh, the radiological tool you use to detect free fluid in the major cavities, chest and abdomen. And you can see the fluid in the Morrison pouch around the spleen, pelvis, or pericardium. But the value is limited in obese patient and the patient with gaseous bowel, gaseous distension of bowel. And the fast scan can be repeated depending on the suspicion. And with the bowel injuries, fast scan may be negative initially. Over the time, slowly, bowel contents, uh, the users may leak and collect and becoming fast positive later. So if you have a get a degree of suspension, you can repeat. And the fast is not able to detect retroperitoneal bleeding. So any uh, the bleeding due to the renal injuries, sometimes blood pressures, may not be detected with the fast scan. There is a disadvantage. What are the indications of laparotomy? Any unstable patients, unstable in the main hemodynamic unstable patient with a positive pass should be considered for laparotomy because there's a, a bleeding lesion in the abdomen you need to control. And evisceration, any bowel contents or the abdominal contents coming out from the wound and patient with peritonitis, guarding rigidity, or generalized tenderness, more like rigidity, and viscous injury, viscous perforation, suggestive of a pneumoperitone. It may detect it on the CT scan or sometimes chest X-ray as a gas under the diaphragm. When do you consider the conservative treatment of solid organs like liver, kidney, renal, these injuries you will get to know and you will suspect from the mechanism and when the fast positive and you will further suspect whether uh, liver injured or splenic injured depending on the location. But if the patient is having a stable vitals, stable means blood pressure more than 90, 90 to 100, consider this stable. You don't need 120 all the time. You can do contrast in a CT to diagnose, confirm the, whether actually the solid organ injured. And the, there are various grades of injuries. One, two, three, four, or five. But whatever the grade, as long as patient stable, blood pressure remains with minimal resuscitation efforts, you can consider managing patient conservatively. Should not be in the ward, should be at least HDU or ICU. Right, so I will give some useful algorithms to take decisions regarding the abdomen and pelvic assessment. If you're using the fast scan, and if the fast scan uh, negative, but the patient is unstable, consider other sources of bleeding, like external bleeding, limb injuries. And if the patient is stable, observe or repeat the fast scan later. It might be positive later. If the patient is fast positive and the vital is unstable, that patient need to go to the operation theater for surgery to control the major body cavity bleeding. But if that patient is stable, as I said earlier, blood pressure remains more than 90, you can consider doing CT scan to, to further delineate the injury patterns. Sometimes the fast is indeterminate due to the body habitus or a lot of gases, surgical emphysema. In that case, 
again, if the patient is stable, better to explore and see. Or else, if the patient is stable, do other forms of assessment using CT scan of further observation. Penetrating abdominal injury. So is there a difference between the penetrating and blunt injury, blunt abdominal injury management? Yes, there's a slight difference. If the, if the patient has penetrating injury due to the knife, stab injury, or gunshot injury, if the patient is unstable, quickly need to go to the laparotomy to explore the wounds. But if the patient is stable, you can do CT scan to find the damage, active bleeding areas or pneumoperitoneum. And if the patient is stable, you can consider doing step wound explorations. If the parietal peritoneum is not, not a breach, then you can just suture the wound, uh, the no need of laparotomy. But if the parietal peritoneum is breached, that there may be visceral injury. So better do a laparotomy and thorough assessment of uh, the visual inspection. But some use serial observation with the patient developing peritonitic signs, go to theater early. So therefore, there's a thing called the step, uh, the, the wound exploration in penetrating wounds. If the parietal peritoneum is breached, that indicates that there may be injuries within the abdomen. So you have to look for, it may be a, even a few millimeter puncture in the bowel that can cause peritonitis. So you need to have a thorough look. And uh, the, if parietal peritoneum not breached, you can just do the wound suturing and come out. And but it still continue to observe. Blunt abdominal injury. So again, patient with unstable, past positive patients, that means there's a bleed. You start resuscitation method and they may not respond or transient respond or uh, uh, responding uh, nicely. So those who don't respond or transient responding should be considered for laparotomy. But with the resuscitation, if the patient responding, blood pressure picking up, can consider a CT scan and uh, depending on the CT finding, whether it's viscous injury, the bleeding lesions, or solid organ injury, uh, you can manage accordingly. Right, pelvic injuries also. <clears throat> if, the, if there's a, a pelvic fracture, if the, if the patient is unstable, patient should have a pelvic binder, start up with resuscitation. And if the positive pass may need to do a laparotomy, at the same time, you can do the extra peritoneal packing. And uh, the, if, if it's still unstable, you can consider CT angiography. If you detect any bleeding contrast as a contrast leakage, consider angioembolization. And if the patient has stable, you can observe and Pass negative, but patient unstable. So then you can do the extrapetoneal packing. You don't need laparotomy. And with the, with the extrapetoneal packing, you can get the control of 80% of the pelvic bleeding, usually venous bleeding. Right. So that's all. Uh, I want to talk 
with regard to the trauma introduction and the abnormal. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you very much, sir, for the detailed lecture on. Uh, but uh, that was Dr. Veena Bandar, consultant surgeon on the topic of induction of abdominal trauma. So next up is uh, lower limb fractures by Dr. Gunasekaram. I think sir has logged in now. Professor Malasekar will be joining now. Ah, okay, right. I'm already logged in. Actually, I was supposed to start at 1.10. So, till what time can I... I was supposed to lecture from 1.10 to 1.40. So, till what time can I lecture? Or... Hello, is there somebody? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, sir. No, no, uh, so yeah, next was... lecture is from uh, one uh, ten to one forty. So we can take that time. Yeah, no, it's already one twenty three. Yeah, sir. So, yeah. Okay, so, so we start until. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and finish in fifteen minutes if possible. Okay. No, so we can take until um, one fifty somewhere there. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Or yes, sir. We can. Right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be dealing with a very simple topic, uh, which you all are you all have probably seen quite a lot of, and uh, also uh, had several lectures during your MBBS careers. So this is the typical kind of person that prevents with this scenario, a uh, young man with right-sided classical loin to groin pain and very severe. And uh, the characteristic of this uh, uh, condition is that it is a colicky type of pain. Uh, the Suddenly the pain comes, it rises up to a very severe excruciating level and then the pain disappears almost automatically or with some painkillers, etc. Right? Short duration. Uh, and it is known to be caused classically by stones in the urinary system, uh, most possibly at the pelvic junction or during, uh, along the pathway of the ureter or uh, at the VU junction. Sometimes caliceal stones also can cause this, but not very common. Okay. And uh, now the position of the pain can give an indication as to where the stone is. For example, uh, if it is caliceal or pelvic junction stones, pain is bound to be more upper abdominal or more in the flanks. Ureteric stones, which will be more with radiation towards the groin. And this lower ureteric stones, one of the things that patients will complain of is low urinary tract symptoms. I've seen quite a lot of patients who come in with, uh, they say that they want to pass in, pass urine, but they cannot pass urine. And then what happens is that because uh, there is severe abdominal pain and also uh, patient is complaining of uh, inability to pass urine, they get a catheter put in. So please be aware of that. Lower ureteric calculi, severe abdominal pain, patient is unable to pass urine. That doesn't mean acute urinary retention. 
Okay, it can be a ureteric. It is very likely to be a ureteric colic. So be aware of that. Now, uh, some of the other features that you need to look at are uh, patient is obviously a very anxious patient. Uh, unlike the typical peritonitis kind of abdomens, they are very agitated. They are moving about. They are almost sometimes walking around because uh, they don't know what to do with these agonizing pain. Tenderness, remember, in contrast to the peritonitis kind of pictures that you have and the intra-abdominal other uh, pathologies, in these patients, pain is very, very uh, severe. However, tenderness is uh, very minimal. Tenderness is very minimal. There may be some uh, renal angle tenderness or deep palpation in the region where the stone is can cause some element of pain or they may just fear and pretend to uh, almost that of... Uh, it's more psychological rather than actual tenderness. Right? So, guarding and rigidity should be absent in these patients with ureteric colic so that you must make sure. Now, what are the... Differential diagnosis. Uh, any patient with possible appendicitis, biliary calculi, acute gastroenteritis, acute pyelonephritis, pancreatitis can be uh, a, a, a confusing picture with acute uh, ureteric colics, but you will always remember that these pains come and go. And when you examine the abdomen, if you clearly examine the abdomen, the classical ureteric colic will be without any tenderness and guarding. In the female, twisted ovariensis, salvingitis, ectopic pregnancy. So these are very important uh, diagnoses not to be missed. Always ask uh, regarding the last menstrual period. These are very important. Then any type of neuritis, you can have radiating pain from the back to the front, even down to the groin if uh, nerve is compressed or inflamed. Herpes zoster, always have a look at the back and see whether there are any blisters or whether there is any hyperesthesia. You touch the skin and there may be pain for these patients. Older patients always keep an eye on diverticular disease and of course the dreaded aortic aneurysms, other retroperitoneal bleeding, etc. Because sometimes, you know, you will have patients who, there are patients, enough and more case reports you will see, where the uh, person has uh, had a, peri a retroperitoneal uh, sealed uh, a rupture of an aortic aneurysm compressing ureter and causing a typical ureteric colic. Okay, so... You, we know what a ureteric colic feels like. We know some of the differential diagnosis. Now, what are the other classical things, important points in the history as a house officer that you need to pick up? Now, you need to ask these patients about any fever. You need to ask them about any signs of infection, right? Any chills, uh, shakes and shivers, uh, uh, burning with passing urine. Uh, obstruction, of course, is a more uh, investigative finding. Renal impairment, you can ask the patient, you know, do you have any other comorbidities that can impair your kidneys? Diabetics is a flare sign. Patients may know they are past creatinines. And if they know that they have a single kidney, in which case it makes it a, a very important uh, diagnosis to pick up and uh, call your seniors about it. Even if somebody has had several surgeries, you know, if you look at the abdomen, you can see flank incisions, in which case you will identify that this patient has had previous operations on the kidney, maybe even a nephrectomy, trauma and nephrectomy. And uh, uh, so that kind of patient, a single kidney patient is not somebody you're going to manage conservatively. And of course, risk factors for recurrence, uh, bilateral stones, past history, young patients, strong family history. Now, this is just to highlight a uh, 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 scenario that you know most urologists have come across. Uh, 
old uh, gentleman, typical left-sided loin to groin pain, very severe, hypertensive diabetes. Now, for me, when I see this patient, I am a little concerned. The kind of red flags flare up for me. I mean, not that this patient cannot have a, a diagnosis of ureteric stones, but you need to be careful because sometimes the CTs can show you diseases like this, diverticular disease, which may be ruptures, perforations, diverticulitis, and collections, etc., or maybe even a dreaded problem like a uh, ruptured aortic aneurysm, right? So always complete your, even if the history tells you this is a ureteric colic, feel the abdomen, make sure it's non-tender, no guarding, no rigidity, feel the femoral arteries, especially in an older patient, complete your abdominal examination before you say this is ureteric colic clinically. So, yes, diagnosis, clinical features, you know, 99% of the time you can come up with a diagnosis clinically, but confirm with imaging. Urine fill report is very useful. More than 90% will have microscopic hematuria, but of course, remember some of our uh, hospital sector, government hospital sector, UFRs are not the best uh, and not very useful. So may not be helpful in your cases. If you pick up a lot of pusses, bacteriuria, make sure that you send off a urine culture, why it's a count to be assessed. That can be useful because if it's a pure ureteric colic stone obstructing, that is not much to think about. But if it is combined with an infection, it's a medical surgical emergency, you need to deal with it immediately. So in those patients, again, a serum creatinine to check the kidney function, full blood count, CRP is useful. Now, what about imaging? Now, I told you diagnosis is clinical as far as uh, also imaging. You have to have an X-ray and an ultrasound combined to get an uh, uh, idea of what is going on or an intravenous urogram, not commonly used nowadays, uh, 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 non-contrast CT, if you have the luxury, probably not at the government sector, but if you have the luxury in a selected patients, it can be useful. So an X-ray will show us, yes, a ureteric calculus, but remember, even though most stones are radiopaque, you will practically only see about 50% of them and to be able to identify them as ureteric stones. Quite a lot, uh, quite, some of them may be radiolucent, uric acid, cysteine, and it will depend on the adequacy of bowel preparation. Ultrasound will show us obstruction, hydronephrosis, hydroureta, so that can give us a clue and also tell us the degree of the obstruction. Is it mild, moderate degree of obstruction? Is there fluid dextravasation, which can again tell you about uh, the uh, degree of obstruction and the complications. Stones, renal stones can be identified, ureteric stones, difficult. IVU, uh, not uh, commonly used. Uh, CT, if you have the luxury of a good uh, station, sometimes can be used and it can tell you exactly where the stone is, what is the size of the stone, and also a little bit about the uh, presence of hydronephrosis obstruction, which will give you an indication of uh, 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 the complications that are taking place. So, now you have got this patient, you have excluded to a certain extent the differential diagnosis, you have an idea of any complications, any renal function impairments, UTIs, uh, sepsis, etc. So you get on to the management. The first objective in your case should be manage the patient's pain because these patients are guys who guys and girls who come shouting, screaming in pain, right? So oral analgesic, if it works, may be good enough or may, it may require suppository, diclofenac suppositories work well. The only issue is that sometimes uh, there may be already uh, renal impairment and you may worsen that. So you need to be a little cognizant of that. Parenteral uh, injections may be needed uh, in SAIDs or preferentially 
uh, either pethidine or morphine can be used, uh, but you must be sure of the uh, diagnosis. So if you have any doubts, always call a senior registrar or your consultant before you administer the parenterals and you kind of um, uh, uh, dilute the diagnosis. So generally, if you have a complication such as a urinary sepsis along with the ureteric obstruction, one of the main things that you've got to think of is decompression of the system. You cannot just treat the infection by antibiotics or just give painkillers and wait. If you have a have an obstruction, you need to go and deobstruct, and you get to get the surgical urological teams on board and get their help. Right? Management of the calculus you can do secondarily, either conservatively, shockwave surgical treatment. I'm not going to go into details because that is not the intent of this. Uh, of this, these lectures. Conservative treatment, you need to make sure that it is an uncomplicated renal or ureteric stone. Uh, uh, there is no distal obstruction. In a sense, there should be no ureteric strictures, for example. Uh, generally, stones less than 4 millimeters, 80-90% or more chance of passing spontaneously. Beyond 7 millimeters, maybe lesser chance, maybe 50% or so beyond one centimeter, don't bother. These stones are not passing. And if it's proximal, uh, it has a lesser chance of passing. When do we say we cannot manage these patients uh, conservatively? If there is obstruction associated with a urinary tract infection or any obstruction of, of the kidneys with urinary sepsis, do not manage them conservatively. You need to get your seniors involved. You need to get the surgical teams, urological teams involved. Decompression is an urgent matter. Otherwise, you will lose this kidney within 24, 48 hours. If it's severe, uncontrollable pain, again, for humanitarian reasons, you cannot discharge this patient on paracetamol and tell him to go sort himself out. You've got to uh, manage him. If it's a single kidney or if you think it's bilateral obstruction, again, conservative management is not going to work. And if it is large stones, if it's a one centimeter, one and a half centimeter stone, don't bother with conservative management. Social reasons, occupation, maybe uh, bus drivers, train drivers, people who are flying out of the country, etc., etc. You need to uh, uh, kind of uh, make sure that you treat them urgently. Conservative treatment with alpha receptor blockers, there is some evidence, so it is useful to uh, get them on board. Obviously, give some painkillers, oral analgesics, uh, uh, maybe you can give some uh, uh, paracetamol or paracetamol combined with codeine, maybe a, a diclofenac or MSA if there is no allergies, no asthma, no impairment of renal function and maybe oral tramadol also can help on a SOS basis. Now, when you discharge these patients, now you are in charge of discharging and a summary follow-up, the absence of symptoms, you need to tell patients that just because pain disappears in a ureteric stone patient, that doesn't mean that the patient is stone-free. They need to come back to the clinic, have some imaging to confirm that the stone has passed. And also, once the stone has been confirmed to have passed, you need to tell them you are at risk of forming stones, especially the younger patients. You need to increase your fluid intake. At least make sure that you take uh, three, four liters of water to produce at least two liters of urine per day and seek medical help if they get any further pains or further hematurias. Right? Recurrent stone formers, pick them up and then go on to investigate them for uh, further uh, uh, causes. Such as, are their calcium levels okay, phosphate levels? Do they have any other problems such as 24-hour calciums, uh, any, uh, any uh, obstructions to their uh, urinary systems which may be causing uh, uh, most stone formations, etc. So these are things that you need to uh, uh, 
kind of look at and uh, uh, evaluate before you uh, discharge them. Uh, I have come to 140, which was the official time. Uh, has the next, next lecturer joined in or? I have a couple of case scenarios which may be useful. Can somebody speak up and tell me, has the next lecturer joined in? Hello. College of Surgeons, can you tell me, has the next lecturer joined in? Anybody from the ministry has the next lecturer joined in? I got two case in a. Has the next lecturer joined in? If so, I can uh, stop here. I, I have two case scenarios to continue. What will you do? Uh, yeah, we can continue, sir. Sorry. Right. At, at any point, tell me and I will stop. Okay. Sure thing, sir. Yes. Okay. So, this is a 42 uh, year old female diabetic, right loin to groin pain with hematuria has been prescribed oral antibiotics for a possible UTI in the community, 101 fever. Now, this is a case scenario that you may get. Uh, sometimes these diabetics even present without fever. I have had a couple of patients very septic but without fevers uh, so the main thing that you need to figure out is right loin to groin pain it may be a ureteric obstruction and the fact that they are diabetic fever that they may be in sepsis so this patient x-ray kub or a ct shows a ureteric obstruction and a grossly dilated pelvic aliceal system hydronephrosis now this is an impending disaster you need to go and de-obstruct this uh, patient, right? So either a JJ stenting or a nephrostomy. So you need to flag this patient up. All the other colleagues can wait. This patient in the middle of the night, you need to pick up, call your seniors, tell them to come and see, get a nephrostomy in or a JJ stent in and get the antibiotics, the cultures followed by antibiotics and the supportive treatment, etc. Right? So always remember that. Stone treatment can wait for later. Stone treatment can wait for later. Decompression is the only necessity. Okay. Okay. So just another patient, 62-year-old male with left loin to groin pain, hematuria, very small stone, no complications. However, diabetic can be managed conservatively. So you let the patient go home. Pain settles. Patient is nicely sitting at home, doesn't do anything. And lo and below, behold, does not come to the clinic because nobody has told them, right? So always remember these patients need to have some sort of imaging to make sure that the stone has passed. If you ask urologists, they will tell you so many case scenarios where patients turn up later with pyonephrosis. That kidney is gone. I mean, there is no point decompressing and do all in this. I mean, by the time they turn up, you know, 48 hours, 72 hours later, the kidney is dead, right? So always remember, absence of, you need to tell this to patients, absence of pain does not mean passage of stones. So they need to come and make sure that the hydronephrosis has resolved and the obstruction has resolved and then that the stone has passed, okay? Okay, so I'll stop there in the... We have time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if any questions, I can take them on. Or yes, uh, thank you for that uh, conversation lecture on your colleague. That was Professor. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Professor <clears throat> Malasekar. So uh, I think there's a change in the lecture set up because some have stopped in between. Uh, I think next lecture is done by Dr. Gunasekaram on lower limb fractures, I suppose. Uh, let's see.
Uh, hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm calling the coroner as a plastic surgeon. I think uh, it's 140. I, I'm scheduled to have the lecture at 140. Okay, I'm so ready with that, my presentation. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, sir, we can see. Yes, you can start. Sir. Yeah, if you can't see my uh, slides, uh, stop me, okay? I'm sharing. Yeah. So can we move one and two? Or Pardon? Can we move a slide and see if it's moving? It's not moving. Oh, yeah. Right, it's moving. Yes. Is it moving? We can start. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we'll uh, uh, discuss uh, some important aspects about the assessment of the injured hand. Uh, so this is a, a common form of trauma. If we take uh, casualty uh, trauma admissions uh, to a general surgical uh, admission, about uh, one third uh, of patients is having either to uh, uh, injury to the hand or to the upper limb. Uh, this may be an isolated hand injury or it may be a part of a, a multi-trauma patient. Uh, this can produce a significant source of morbidity and uh, many of these are work-related. Some are interpersonal uh, uh, violence and some are due to self-inflicted injuries. The most important thing here is majority of these patients are young and in the productive age group. And uh, so they are the uh, earning uh, capacity uh, for their uh, families. So in my uh, presentation, I'm uh, doing an overview of hand injury evaluation. This is not a comprehensive discussion of each specific structure. So like, I'm not going to detail uh, into the management of uh, flexor tendon injuries, like, but it's a general overview. And I assume uh, all our uh, doctors are having a basic uh, anatomical knowledge about the hand and its function. So aim of our uh, management of an injured hand is a maximal functional restoration in a minimum given time. So why this maximum functional restoration and minimum time mentioned here is, you know, uh, after some injuries, uh, patients are going to lose some of the important uh, functions in the hand, especially uh, with regard to uh, mutilating and complex hand injuries. So, they, we will not be able to uh, provide them with a pre-injured hand, but our aim is to give some sort of functioning hand so that they will be able to carry out their personal uh, activities, uh, professional and then activities of daily living uh, without being dependent on others. Why this minimum time? Say, if you take an, a, a patient with appendicitis, the patient admitted with the right, right, right RIF pain, they get diagnosed acute appendicitis and they go to theater, get their appendix removed. And then after maybe one or two days, they'll be uh, going home. And a couple of weeks time, they'll be back in the society uh, working uh, as usual. But with a patient with a hand injury, even a fingertip uh, skin loss, they will not be able to go back to their uh, functional status uh, because the wounds uh, tend to take longer to heal in the hand. And also, it, they need some special thing called uh, rehabilitation or uh, hand therapy to get their uh, function back. So that's why uh, minimum time. So obviously, this hand injury recovery and then the functional restoration or going back to the society takes longer than uh, to another surgical problem. So if we manage it uh, correctly, so this minimum time uh, can be uh, so that we can do it in a, a minimum time period. Another important thing is outcome of a given hand injury is almost directly related to the skill and uh, care provided by the primary treating surgical team. So it's very important to manage these patients carefully to avoid subsequent uh, complications. And there are uh, lots of uh, work and its time is directly related to the care that we are providing. So as I mentioned earlier, it's, it can be part of uh, multi-trauma or it can be isolated injury. So here, this hand injury comes at the secondary reserve, not at the primary service. So in a patient whose 
had a prime minister be resuscitated and stabilized, is going to get the hand assist uh, and then manage. So, like in any other form of medicine, you take a history. What is the mechanism of injury? That's most important. Is it a cut injury, crush injury, avulsion, blast, burn? Likewise, what exactly happened and what time uh, the injury happened? And then this is important, especially in, in cases of uh, microscular uh, revascularization. We had to do it in a uh, timely manner. If we prolong it too long, uh, so we will not be able to uh, salvage some of the fingers. So in, in history, you ask the patient about pain, uh, swelling, uh, deformity, and problems with movement. These are the common symptoms they'll have. So in addition, you take the general things like age, gender, dominant hand, occupation, smoking, comorbidities, and so on. And in preparation to uh, anesthesia, also you have to ask certain questions. So that is for the history. Now, when we come to the proper hand assessment, so this is the order. Say, for example, if you assess the respiratory system, you know general examination followed by systemic examination, inspection, percussion, uh, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, like that. But in, in, in our case, in hand, so this is what we do in the assessment uh, in order. So vascular injury, whether there's a vascular uh, compromise or there's arterial injury or whether there's penis congestion like that, neurologic status of the hand, whether there's a nerve injury, skin integrity, whether the skin is broken or is an open wound or it's a closed wound, if it's the skin is damaged, can we achieve skin cover primarily or whether we need to do something to get skin cover? Then in the hand, uh, what are the deformities the patient is having following the hand? It can be angular uh, angulation of the finger or it can be rotation of the finger. So angulation, rotation, deformity uh, has to be assessed. So if these things are there, if there's angulation or rotation, there should be a fracture or a dislocation un until proven otherwise. In assessing the uh, movement, the important thing is to assess the flexor and excessor tendon. Uh, so ask the patient to uh, gently move the fingers and show whether these are in proper uh, uh, movement cascade. Sometimes because of the pain, the patient will not be able to move properly. So in such cases, so you can give analgesia and then sometimes local anesthetic uh, blocks like digital blocks or common digital nerve blocks or nerve blocks like wrist block uh, to facilitate the assessment. So I'll show you some clinical uh, uh, examples how to do these things. So uh, if you uh, assess the vascularity, first thing that you have to check is uh, the color of the finger. Now in this patient, you can see the fingertip that in this child with the index finger and middle finger injury, you can see the middle finger color it's bluish, it's dusky. So there's a uh, vascular injury. So there's a vascular injury in this child's hand. If you look carefully, the other fingers are nice and pink. That's the normal color of the hand. In the middle finger, you can see the color change. What you do in the fingers is you check your capillary refill. You know, you press on your fingernail, uh, look for blanching, and then the capillary should be less than two seconds. You can do this in soft tissue also. Here in this picture, you can you are checking to press the palm of the finger, observe a blanching, and then return of the blood supply. So capillary refill. So each finger you have to check separately, and then the document. And then uh, as you go more proximally, uh, you can check pulses. Uh, if you feel uh, pulses, uh, you have to feel uh, radial pulse, uh, ulnar pulse. As you go proximally in the cubital fossa region. Uh, you can feel uh, the brachial artery also. Then assessing the neurological status. What we do is we just do a very brief, crude uh, neurologic assessment in the injured hand, not like what you do in your neurology appointment. What we do is you check for touch with your finger. You touch the patient's finger. Always very important to compare with the uninjured hand. Educate the patient, this is your normal feeling, and compare that with the injured side, ask whether you feel it. If you feel it, is it normal like the normal side? Two questions that you have to ask, do you feel? Yes. Is it like normal? Yes. So if that is so, that, that means there's a 
normal sensation. There's no uh, sensory nerve uh, injury. So in the anatomy, you know that the fingers are having uh, digital nerves. And then as they come to the palm, you have uh, common digital nerves. And then more proximally, you have median, ulnar, radial. So you should know the distribution of them. And then so that you can assess the integrity of the each and every nerve. So this is this the diagram from your anatomy books uh, to show the, the median, ulna, uh, and radial nerve distribution uh, of the hand. For a hand, you have a, a normal uh, posture. So when you relax your hand like this, your wrist is uh, extended and your fingers are flexed towards the palm. So that is a normal posture of your hand. And this can be disturbed in case of a skeletal injury like in a fracture or a dislocation or in a uh, case where there's a tendon injury. So ask the patient gently open the hand and when you ask the patient to close the hand, there's a movement cascade that you can see. So all the fingers are uh, converging towards the, uh, the thin aminus. That's a normal uh, feeling. And the other thing is you ask the, you passively uh, extend the uh, fingers on your wrist flexion and you uh, extend the wrist and then your fingers will come to a uh, flexed posture. So this is the tenodesis action of the wrist. When you do this movement, if I think you can see my uh, video and uh, my uh, view. The fingers goes into extended position in wrist flexion and then it goes to uh, flex position in wrist extension. So this is the normal cascade. So that's a very important observation. If this normal cascade is broken, then there's a skeletal injury. So that's the normal posture of the hand in the small hand. And then uh, on the other hand, you can see the deformity. Uh, the finger, middle finger is deviated to the uh, ulna side and there's a slight rotation. So there's an angulation and rotation. So unless you prove an otherwise, there's a skeletal injury, especially a fracture or a dislocation in this case. And this is the uh, test in the tenodesis section to uh, check for uh, flexor tendon and extensor tendon integrity. Uh, and then there are uh, specific uh, postures that you can uh, see. Uh, so rotation here, overriding fingers, there's a rotation. And this small child's hand, you can see when the child is trying to flex all the fingers, these two index and middle finger is not coming to the flexion. So that is due to a tendon, even, even though you don't see an injury here. This is an injured uh, hand about two weeks back. Now the wound has healed. Now these two fingers are not flexing. So this is a mixed tendon injury. So it's very difficult to uh, manage if you have a condition like this. And this is a uh, pointing finger uh, in a case of ulna, proximal ulna injury. When you ask the patient to make a fist, they will not be able to uh, flex at the index finger and the thumb. Uh, due to the uh, denervation of the flexopolysis longus and flexodigitorum profundus tendon. So this is the pointing uh, uh, index finger uh, sign due to a proximal median nerve injury. This is how you check your flexodigitorum superficialis. You block the adjacent fingers uh, and then keep them in extension and then you uh, ask the patient to flex and then they will effectively flex at the proximal interphalangeal joint and they will not be able to effectively flex at the distal interphalangeal joint. So this is how you check for flexor digitorum uh, superficialis. This is how you check for uh, flexor digitorum profundus. You block the middle phalanx in extension and then ask the patient to flex the distal phalanx and the patient will uh, flex at the distal phalanx. Uh, so if that is there, so the FDP, flexodigitorum profundus is intact, intact. So you do this in all the fingers. So in the thumb, you have only one tendon, uh, one interphalangeal joint. So you ask the patient to flex at the interphalangeal joint to assess the uh, flexopolysis longer. So that is the only tendon which flexes at the uh, interphalangeal joint. There's no uh, Next, and uh, this is the ulna now. This is a, a classic picture of a uh, ulna claw hand. 
you can see the hyperextension at the metacarpalangeal joint and flexion at the interparangeal joint, and they'll have numbness in the ulnar nerve distribution uh, of the hand. This is a picture of a wrist drop uh, due to high uh, radial nerve injury. They'll be uh, having a wrist drop like this, and they are unable to extend at the wrist, and they will not be able to extend their fingers and the thumb. So this is a uh, one technique of giving local anesthetic uh, for digital nerve block. And then in the assessment, you have to assess the mechanism of injury uh, in the hand. So this is uh, a cut injury. You can see it's a very uh, clean cut like surgical incision, uh, cut with a knife, uh, two parallel lines here. So there's no uh, tissue loss, no rugged edges, very clean uh, cut, but all the structures are cut from skin to uh, bone in here. So there's a lot of work. So this is a uh, patient with a uh, relatively uh, blunt uh, trauma. It's a laceration by a machine, moving machine. And you can see uh, irregular uh, edges uh, of this laceration. Uh, and then you can see some of the fingers are in different directions. So in laceration, the edge is irregular, uh, rugged, and there's significant uh, uh, tissue loss. Crush injuries can be of uh, varying degrees. Usually they are due to uh, machinery injury. It can be fingertip uh, to uh, uh, the whole hand. So these are very uh, devastating injury because there's significant uh, soft tissue and skeletal tissue bone damage, and they are real. Uh, they can be real uh, challenge to the uh, reconstruction. So fingertip injuries uh, are of varying degrees, uh, from simple uh, skin loss to a total finger tip loss, and uh, it's very important to identify them and then uh, have to reconstruct accordingly because it's not just. It is just not a matter of refashioning. So if we can reconstruct, we have to reconstruct because the most sensitive part of your hand, you feel the world with your fingertips. So it's like your eye in the hand. So it's very important to uh, reconstruct as much as possible. So uh, blast or uh, gunshot firearm injuries are not, not very common to see these days. But during the war period, we had a lot of this sort of injuries, uh, extensive tissue damage, both mechanical and thermal. The significant uh, energy uh, transfer uh, happening to these uh, tissues, uh, burning and then mechanical damage. So there's significant tissue loss, so very high chance of losing the hand function. So most important to assess and then document, debride, and then uh, start reconstructing. So this is a burn can be of varying degree from superficial to deep. Sometimes you might need uh, grafts and all that. This is a run over injury or a degloving. The skin and soft tissue is separate from the deep tissue, deep uh, structures. And they are also having a very significant energy transfer to these. Uh, uh, these are mutilated hand injuries. Uh, you can see uh, very uh, complex hand injuries. So they need expertise care. Uh, traumatic amputations can be uh, replanted when they are in suitable conditions in, in centers where there's a microscope. Uh, so hands, fingers, this sort of things can be uh, reattached called replantation. So when you get a hand injury, you assess, you take history, uh, you assess, you assess the mechanism of injury and you have to document all that. Uh, before you take the patient to theater. Then uh, important thing, you have to ask yourself, should I treat the injured hand or do I know how to treat and do I know how to do the definitive management? If I don't know, then I have to refer to a, a specialist care or a specialist center. Then the, the, then the next thing is you have to uh, think about the, the transfer or the uh, delay in uh, transferring. So if the vascularity is there, there's no uh, uh, very urgency, you can uh, transfer uh, within uh, say 12 to 4, uh, 24 hour period. But uh, if there's vascular compromise, then you have to uh, transfer them immediately to a place where there's uh, facilities for vascular repairs and microscular. So when these patients come to the emergency, there's a few principles that you have to do. Control of the hemorrhage with direct uh, pressure on the you apply direct firm pressure and then elevate the injured area. 
and that will prevent swelling also and then important thing is not to put the tourniquets around and uh, that will cause uh, uh, constrictions and then uh, cut off blood supply and then uh, cause more tissue damage immobilization with uh, temporary splints may be cardboard plastics or plaster of paris and that will provide pain relief and prevent further uh, tissue damage uh, assessment of the injured hand is not complete until you take the patient to theater and then uh, do a thorough assessment under good analysis and uh, good lighting so this is a, a diagram to show uh, the base of means of extending the wound you can't just cut in the hand there are uh, principles and then base and means of making incisions if you don't know and uh, to, to make it you have to study or you have to uh, refer to a place where that can be done properly in exploration especially in sharp injuries you have to check from skin to bone uh, then the nerves tendons muscles uh, joints and bones everything you have to assess and then make sure they are intact or if, if they are damaged then you have to plan for uh, repair if you don't extend the wound and you are going to miss important structures like a retracted tendon or a nerve so when they are having open wounds where it's paramount important is to do a proper wound debridement we call it wound toilet or wash out and then uh, think about how to close the skin or the soft tissue and then if we can achieve primary healing that is best uh, with uh, less scarring and uh, when you have open uh, condemned wound take them to theater debride wash out with saline or sterile water and then make it in, into a cleaner wound and then uh, do your repairs and then reconstruct close and then go so this is what we do in the operation theater under appropriate anesthesia and good light with good adequate facilities initially wash or a scrub with antiseptic solution tonic is essential to have blood test field copious irrigations have to identify critical structures tendons nerves bones muscles all that and if the uh, if the uh, tissue is dead wound margins can be uh, uh, trimmed but we have to uh, do this very carefully not to cut uh, too much and then macroscopic dirt and porridge material has to be uh, removed uh, by dissection and then uh, by washing it out and then when it you convert this uh, dirty wound to a clean wound and then if the uh, uh wound is clean enough then you plan for your repairs and uh, reconstructions at the end of all repairs and reconstruction you keep the patient's uh, hand in a position called position of safe immobilization where there's the wrist is extended metacarpalangeal joints are flexed to around 80 to 90 degrees and interphalangeal joints of the fingers are in extension and thumb in adduction like this so this is the position of safe immobilization where these joints are having collateral ligaments on the other side and they are in their maximum strength even though the hand is going to get uh, contracted and fibrous they are in their maximum length and then can rehabilitate the hand so the position of safe immobilization is a thing to know here in delayed cases longer the delay the more the problems you will see edema infection ongoing tissue necrosis and tissue loss and granulation tissue they are all uh, uh, cause problems to us so they will develop stiffness they will develop scarring all this granulation tissue is going to uh, replace with scar tissue which is going to keep the keep all the structures together and then uh, prevent move on and then uh, you will end up with a very poor or bad outcome so priorities in repair is vascularity skin cover skin cell stability tendons now so so like in long bone fractures uh, small bone fractures uh, in the hands has to be fixed there can be various classification open or closed stable fractures unstable fractures comminuted fractures and assess about the deformity displacement angulation and rotation and then involvement of the articular surface all that has to be assessed and then uh, fixed accordingly so uh, flexor tendons uh, uh, injury zones are classified from 1 to 5 these are for communication and descriptive purposes uh, based on the underlying anatomy 
uh, nice to know them, so on one to five. And there are various uh, tendon repair techniques are available, uh, but you need to have uh, uh, some basic knowledge and training uh, before you start repairing tenders. If you don't know how to repair it, don't touch it. Uh, send to a place where they can do it better. So these are extensor tendons. Extensor tendons are also classified according to uh, sorts of injuries. And they are relatively uh, thin uh, sheets and flat bands. Uh, it's not easy to repair extensor tendons. And you pay less attention, but they are important uh, to correctly uh, repair it. So these are magnified even for digital uh, or uh, now under the microscope. So you need magnification to do, to the, to do these repairs with uh, very fine sutures. So repairing nerves is very important. Uh, if, they, if you repair, they will re recover. You need very fine uh, uh, sutures like uh, eight or nine or, uh, or seven or like that, according to the size of the structure. At the end of all this, put a good bandage, splint it, and then very important to elevate in the board like this, as in this uh, photograph, and to prevent edema uh, happening. And then let the therapist to start their therapy protocols. All these hand injuries has to be seen by a therapist who's uh, familiar with managing hands. There are various protocols and uh, techniques of doing this. So important to uh, send them to a uh, 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 a therapist who can uh, rehabilitate the hand. Otherwise, the hand is going to get stiff and non-functional. So management of this hand injuries can be complex and vast area. Uh, so you need some expertise and equipment. As interns, what, what we expect you to eat is to assess and then document and then refer uh, appropriately uh, to people who can manage this. If you don't do this, and the patient is going to get a, a poor outcome. So initial assessment that is done by you, and then referral to the management is vital, and that is uh, going to be very uh, significant uh, impact to their long-term life. So pro proper assessment, that is what you have to do, is very important, and that can restore your uh, in patients and function to usual status. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I think. Uh, right. Uh, thank you very much. That was Dr. Thank you. Kolita Gunidas, uh, from College of Surgeons. So, next lecture is Dr. By Dr. Uh, previous lecture, uh, Dr. Anangala on chest injury. I think so. I will join in shortly. So, wait for a second. So, if you all have any questions, we can take this time to answer. Right, so uh, some some people ask me what are the lecture for tomorrow. So I'll share quickly until the next lecture joins. So so these are the line uh, session for tomorrow on wound symposium and uh, clinic patients. So it starts eight and we'll be finishing one. So that's for tomorrow. So now come. Supposed to do uh, is done by Dr. Anangala.
uh, chest injuries. So he's joining now, so you all can use the time and ask questions and all that. So, okay. Internship next week, yeah, please go on a good. What do you Roshan, can I start? Yes, sir, we can start. Uh, all you have to do is make it full screen and we'll run to slide okay. sensor is working. How many may, 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 candidates are there? Moving, sir. Uh, yeah. Can start, no? So can, yeah, can start. So can we move one slide and see? All right, hold on. Yeah. Let's move it. You can start. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, now, um, the next topic for me is cardiothoracic trauma. It's the third common cause of death in uh, some countries. And it accounts for about 50% deaths due to trauma. And the mortality, if injury is confined to the chest, is about 5%. If other, one other system is compromised, is 15%. If more than one other organ system is involved, the mortality is about 30%. The trauma to chest, again, it could be blunt or penetrating. And many patients with major thoracic injuries die at the site of injury. And those who reach hospital alive survive with early skilled intervention. Now, only 15% need major surgery. The remainder can be managed with IC tube, pain relief, and chest physiotherapy. Uh, what are the thoracic injuries like rib fractures, flared chest, and pulmonary contusions, lacerations, and avulsions, pneumothorax, either simple then simple hemothorax, blunt aortic injury, blunt myocardial injury, airway or major vascular injury, then diaphragm injury, the vertebral or spinal injury, and other penetrating injuries. So this is a picture of one patient uh, actually about eight months ago. This lady got a road traffic accident. When she, actually, she was pregnant as well. And then... Uh, in fact, the baby inside the uterus died and she survived because she was transferred here to our accident service, Colombo. And we did the uh, chest wall uh, reconstruction, ribcage reconstruction, and after several days of ICU stay, she survived. The, you are familiar with this uh, skeleton, you know. Actually, what I wanted to tell you is, you know, upper part of the 
although the rib cage is you know angulated anteriorly so there are some structures in the neck uh, which can go into the chest like you know like retrosternal goiters and all and some of the abdominal organs covered by the lower ribs actually you know, could be injured when there's an accident because of the trauma to lower chest uh, so this overlapping anatomy in the neck and abdomen with the chest so anatomic location of the four compartment is not very relevant to trauma but uh, these are there are three zones may, mainly in the chest prevascular zone visceral zone and retrovisceral zone the location of impact i, I show you the pictures also the upper chest high incidence of injury in the base of neck mainly laryngotracheal and pharyngoesophageal injuries and mid chest is damaged to the mediastinum, spinal, and neurological structures. Mediastinum in, in, including the pericardium and the heart, the lung hyla, those stuff. And lower chest, abdominal viscera like liver, spleen, and pancreas could be involved. So, if you can classify depending on degree of severity, there are rapidly lethal injuries or dose injuries that kills in minutes then potentially lethal ones, and then non-immediately life-threatening lesions. But other rapidly lethal ones are airway obstruction, acute airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, massive hemothorax, flail chest, <coughs> and cardiac tamponade. The potentially lethal ones are the lung contusions, aortic rupture, uh, tracheobronchial rupture, esophageal rupture, diaphragmatic rupture, and myocardial contusion. What are non-immediately life-threatening ones? Small pneumothorax, simple pneumothorax, small hemothorax, rib fractures, sternal fractures, soft tissue injury, traumatic chylothorax, intrathoracic foreign body, subcutaneous emphysema. In diagnosis of thoracosoma, history is important. At least if the patient is not conscious, you, you can, from the, the those who bring the patient, they will give you a brief history as to the scene of injury, then examination, do the quick neck and chest examination with the tracheality central, whether there is open wound, surgical emphysema, uh, and uh, any sort of evidence of open wounds like penetrated injuries, any foreign body in situ like Lee Kali Vagadeval chest again. There could be some wooden pieces. And so those top and radiological investments are the more simpler ones x ray uh, of the chest spine and then CT scan with the contrast. Ultrasound, which is called fast scan, focus abdominal sonography for trauma, then contrast solos if indicated, and CT angiogram is in which indicated, and MRI spine if the spinal injury is suspected. And endoscopy may be of help, upper GI or bronchoscopy, then with regard to heart, uh, 2D echo, and lab investigation like full blood count, uh, cross matching fluid for chylomicrons, gram stain, and culture. Initial management. Is ABC like air, adequate airway, breathing, circulation, and for, as for any injury, vitals observation, immobilize the neck and log rolling when uh, spinal cord injury is suspected, and from fluid management. We'll talk of airway obstruction first. And note patency of north and mouth, surgical emphysema in the neck, position of the trachea, intercostal retraction, quality of respiratory movements, obvious signs of respiratory distress. And if extract uh, any foreign bodies in the mouth and lift the jaw, provided no cervical fractures are there. And if unconscious, uh, then oral airway. And if respiratory insufficiency, may need intubation or ambu bag or ventilation. Because nowadays, most patients have, you know, PCUs. I know as a post center, you will not be posted to primary care units or ANEs. You'll be in the ward, but in our time, the patient straight away came when we were house of the patient straight away came to the ward, bleeding and we put chest drains, everything in the ward. So no proper PCU or SN services other than the National Hospital those days. Tension pneumothorax uh, is featured by lung collapse, shifting of mediastinum, lowering of venous return, and severe hemodynamic uh, compromise and needle thoracotonsis initially and followed by chest drain. Drainage of pleural space uh, by pleural aspiration or chest drain insertion. It could be done by the Seldinger technique, open technique, or 
surgical drainage like the keyhole surgery or we call video assisted thoracoscopy surgery open thoracotomy or window thoracotomy so this is uh, you know the safe triangle for chest tread insertion there should be a small correction because um, uh, uh, is the posteriorly is no more the anterior board of the that is not dorsa, but it's the mid axillary line, anteriorly anterior axillary line, and the fourth rib level. And you should know how to put an IC tube. Whenever you get a chance, put a tube. Uh, choose the, the proper site, visualize the X-rays, and then give local anesthetic if the patient needs a break. And then uh, infiltrate well with the local anesthetic. Then using blunt dissection, go into the pleural cavity, infiltrate a bit more in the parietal pleura, and then insinuate your Robert's forcep inside. And then uh, put your finger to sweep, not to use, uh, not, uh, not to tube to injure the lung, so that you will take your lung away from the parietal pleura and then put the tube in. And eventually you need to check the position with an x ray. This is a picture of what I told you. We'll quickly, we'll quickly go through because there are a lot of things. And nowadays, ultrasound IC tubes can be placed with ultrasound guidance as well, especially for loculated collections. In the X-ray, you need to check the last hole of the IC tube. Uh, this is the hole, if you can see my cursor. So on the X-ray, you can see the position and uh, last tube should be within the pleural cavity. Open numeterous. Uh, it ventilation limited, so reduced venous return. So there could be mediastinal movement leading to cardiovascular instability. So treatment is again chest end insertion. Massive hemothorax. Uh, mortality is about 4% with penetrating injuries. Then 50% uh, uh, blunt trauma. Uh, then treatment is fluid management, blood transfusion chest strain insertion, thoracotomy when indicated. For example, if the patient is in deep shock or over two liters at the insertion plus 200 ml every hour and non-responsive to adequate free resuscitation. Those are the indications for thoracotomy in a massive hemothorax patient. And in fact, these numbers may vary from hospital to hospital, then guideline to guideline, but stick to whatever guideline in your hospital. So this is a picture of a thoracotomy where this patient had a diaphragmatic injury. You can see a plural proline mesh. We had to repair the diaphragmatic defect using a proline mesh. Uh, this is the keyhole, so the, the VATS instruments that we use is a key, uh, the normal laparoscopy, the same principle onto the chest, but we won't need, you know, carbon dioxide because uh, when we <clears throat> put the patient in one lung ventilation, lung automatically collapse, so we have the space. Whereas in the abdomen, we have to inflate the abdomen with uh, carbon dioxide so that you get the space for the surgeon to operate. These are keyhole surgery steps. And this is how the keyhole surgery, the instruments inside the chest cavity. <clears throat> this is a small video of the keyhole surgery. Right. How about flail chest? <clears throat> you know the definition of flail chest is uh, two or more ribs fractured more than two places in uh, those ribs in one side. Or it could be, you know, serial fractures on both sides, uh, causing the anterior part of the rib cage to move independently, causing paradoxical movement during the breathing. So <clears throat> if there is flail chest, is an indication for early fixation of the rib cage if the patient is stable. And uh, <clears throat> uh, then oxygen, pain relief, and intubation and ventilation also could be indicated if the patient cannot be taken for surgery straight away, uh, especially if the patient is having uh, associated lung contusion. The patient better be ventilated for some time and then take for a surgery later on. And <clears throat> actually, surgical fixation can uh, 
you know, reduce the time of patient being on the ventilator because there are other issues of ventilation, like ventilator associated pneumonia. So if the patient is stable, otherwise we, if the, the rib, you know, the rib plates and all are available, better to fix the flare chest early to prevent prolonged ventilation. Cardiac tamponade, it, and you will encounter reduced heart sounds, high CVP and low blood pressure, paradoxical pulses and deep shock. And then you can diagnose with fast scan or echocardiogram. And initially you can do pericardiosynthesis that's uh, sticking a needle in and then open surgery if indicated. Potentially lethal injuries, uh, lung contusion and limited fluid loading is important. Otherwise patient will go into you know, ventilatory failure more and fusimide, analgesia, physiotherapy and methylprednisolone have a place. And the neotic rupture, only 15% of patients will read the hospital and CT scan or autogram can diagnose it. Uh, the treatment is front surgical repair. Tracheobronchial rupture. You could have a variable clinical picture depending on the size and the site of the injury. And it could be linear tears or complete transfection or crushing of the uh, airway system. So diagnosis could be done with bronchoscopy, FOB, fiber optic bronchoscopy, and CT scan. And if the patient got the chest strain inserted, you may see continuous bubbling in the, in the um, uh, IC tube bottle. So management could be conservative or could be surgery. <laughs> Give me a minute. Yeah. Next, esophageal ruptures. So could be diagnosed with contrast solo or CT scan with oral contrast, uh, upper GI endoscopy, and management could still be variable with uh, conservative approach. So keep the patient nil by mouth, NG tube insertion, uh, IV fluids, and watch for mediastinitis. And surgical treatment, if you know there is massive mediastinal contamination or patient deteriorating with empyema, then there's a, nowadays there's a very good place for stenting, cover stent to the esophagus after diagnosis. And then after that, you can treat the patient with antibiotic and uh, that stent can be removed later on once the wound is healed. Uh, rarely only we go for primary surgery nowadays for esophageal ruptures. Diaphragmatic rupture management is clinical on the chest X-ray and CT scan you may see uh, some of the abdominal viscera in the chest cavity requiring uh, surgical management uh, to repair the diaphragm. Myocardial contusion, the clinical picture is similar to myocardial infarction and management is close monitoring, arrhythmia control, and you need to take cardiologist input uh, uh, to manage the patient more accurately. What are the non-immediately life-threatening lesions or conditions? Patients at risk are elderly or chronic respiratory disease patients, immunocompromised ones, those who cannot be mobilized due to other reasons. So even a single rib fracture can be dangerous, in, especially in elderly, especially if there is lung contusion and laceration. And this pain may impair the ventilator mechanics. So mortality in over 80 years is about 20%. So even a single rib fracture could be disastrous. So fractures of first two ribs, scapula and sternum could be associated with severe intrathoracic injury. So those are signs of you know, massive impact due to trauma. So I just quickly went through because cardiothoracic trauma cannot be finished in half an hour's time. So because you may be placed in different places in the country where there are no cardiothoracic units in your hospital. So these are the units where cardiothoracic uh, 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 units are available. National Hospital, Javardhanapura, Dedirijja Hospital, Karapitya, Kandy, and Jeffna. Uh, those hospitals have cardiothoracic surgeons, about 20, and National Hospital of Respiratory Disease, there is Valley Center. We got four surgeons there. And there are certain private hospitals where cardiothoracic units are there. In Colombo, there are about six. 
and in Jaffna, candy and gold, one each. Uh, in the next slide, I would like to remind them after internship, you in the post intern phase, I know that nowadays most people have thought of leaving the country. And I advise you guys, some of you at least need to stay in the country because 22 million population. If all of you start leaving the country, there won't be people to treat the nation. So even if you go temporarily, come back, please. So these are the options available from chess point of view. If you are interested in doing surgical field, you can become cardiothoracic surgeons or thoracic surgeons. And from medical point of view, chest related uh, jobs are respiratory physicians, then cardiologists, it could be general, interventional, or cardiac electrophysiologists. And you can become cardiac anesthetists, then intensivists or ICU doctors. And obviously, uh, some of them can become academics or university staff. Good luck for your career. And uh, I, I, I believe some of you may choose cardiothoracic field as your future specialty. Thank you. If there are any questions you can ask, please. Roshan, any questions allowed? Or? We have we have few minutes, sir. So yeah, I mean, if they want to ask any questions, um... they are totally silent from the morning. So <laughs> no, they are not allowed. Or... No, no, they are. They have the liberty to unmute and ask. Okay. So there was eight. Yeah, seven minutes more, no? For the oh no, oh, two, minutes. two minutes only, yeah. Two minutes, yeah. All right, okay. Then shall I wind off there? Okay, so uh, okay, okay, sir. Right, right. Thank you. Right, right. thank you very much, sir. Uh, that's for Dr. Hanagala, uh, consultant, cardiothoracic surgeon from National Hospital Colombo, on the comprehensive lectures. So. Uh, thanks, sir, for joining us, delivering the lecture. Thank you. Busy schedule. So uh, next up is another lecture, important lecture done by Dr. Dr. Ranga Vikramarachi uh, on the topic of renal, renal, renal injury. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Dr. Shivasanga. I am doing these renal injuries. Um, can you hear me? Yes, doctor, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Can you all see yes, I can see uh, slides. Yeah, you need to make it full screen, sir. Is it changed now? Uh, yes, I, yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes, can see and can it see. can we move one slide and see this moving? Uh, I good uh, Yes, moving. Yeah. Yeah. Is it moving? Yes, I can move. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Shwasanga, cancer neurologist from Candy. I'm going to talk about this renal injury. So um, before the talk, I just give a brief introduction regarding the anatomy of the kidneys. So the kidney is located in the retroperitoneum as hiding from the all other abdominal organs, but it's quite important because the kidney is 
hanged by this iota and the IVC by the major vessels, and has a good blood supply from the iota. Is 25 percentage of the cardiac output comes to the kidney, and so whatever the injuries to the kidney can be associated with these major vessel damage can lead to, to a light threading bleeding and the hypertension may end up in death. But most of the time, these kidney injuries are associated with the other abdominal injuries, but sometimes maybe isolated injuries. Uh, the one more structure is connecting with the kidney to the bladder is the ureter. Part of the injuries can be associated with the disruption of the pelvic ureteric junction also. And see the location of the kidneys just hiding at the back side of the tummy, just covered by the ribs also. So that's why, so if any patients comes with the refraction, you need to think about there may be associated kidney injuries. Anyone comes with a splenic injury, we need to have a suspicious for kidney injuries. Any trauma on the right side and the patient comes with a liver injury suspected, we need to think the kidney also may have injury. Then we'll move to the other slides. General term, definition for trauma is defined as a physical injury or wound to the living tissue caused by the extrinsic agent. When you come to the renal injury, the renal injury is Kidneys are the most commonly injured organ in the urinary system when you compare to the kidney, ureter, bladder, and the genitals. This is a kidney because most of the trauma associated with the chest or the abdominal injuries. So whenever the patient have a chest or abdominal injuries, we need to think there may be a kidney injury also. In overall, only 5% of the all trauma cases associated with the renal injury. But when you come to the abdominal trauma, is going up, it's 10 percentage. You always have a suspicious for kidney injury. It is more common in young age and male gender because of this road traffic accident, trauma, violence, and everything, assault. Everything is quite common in the male population. Come to the mode of injuries, it's very easy. So kidney has vessels and the parenchyma. So there are two types of injuries. One is can be parenchymal injury or it can be associated with the hyla vessels inside either artery or vein, sometimes the ureteric injuries. So those are the pattern of injury in the kidney. The mode of injury can be a penetrating or the blunt injuries. Penetrating injuries, so if someone is stepped on the backside in the loin region, then the knife can enter through the posterior abdominal muscles. The next organ is the kidney. So it can directly damage to the kidney. But if someone is step on the anterior aspect of abdomen, so it has to travel through the various other abdominal organs also. But we need to have a suspicious whether it is an anterior aspect or the posterior aspect. If anyone has the step on the right lumbar region, loin, or the subcostal region, we have to suspicious for the kidney injuries. Gunshot of whether it's a posterior anterior can travel through the anatomical location of the kidney. The blunt injuries, most of the time, blunt injuries won't cause any trouble to the kidney because the kidney is covered by the very good fat layer. It's the perinephric and the paranephric fat. So the fat will act as a soft absorber for the kidney. So that's why the injuries are very minimum, but that's dependent on the velocity. If someone is get an accident more than 100 and suddenly stop 100, on 100 kilometer per hour, it can cause any kind of diesel, deceleration injuries to the kidneys, so it can rupture the parenchyma. Falls, if a patient comes to the hospital with a fall from the height, depending on the height of the fall, you have to have a suspicious assault, direct assault to the back of the loin region, lumbar region, we have to have a suspicious for the blunt injuries. So before I move to the slides how to assess this patient. We need to know about what is the grading scale for this renal trauma. <clears throat> the grading usually have five grades. The grade one has a very small subcapsular hematoma, but no or parenchymal laceration or anything. 
If you move to the grade two, it has the subcapsular hematoma and laceration in the kidney parenchyma, but the depth of the laceration is less than one centimeter. It's less severe. But if you move to the grade three, there's more hematoma and laceration is quite more severe. The size or depth of the laceration is more than one centimeter. Grade four are quite severe. The extent of the laceration is going further deep and it's opening into the calicial system. So that's the place. So now urine also can leak into the perinephric space and causing urinoma also. Grade five is very severe, the shattered kidney or associated with the vascular injury. And when you call the patient assessment, so as usual, whoever comes to the hospital with any kind of trauma, we need to clinically evaluate the patient as well as we need to do certain tests. The clinical evaluation consists of history and the examination. The so history, first we need to follow the ATLS protocol and do the primary survey. And, and during the secondary survey, you can ask more relevant history from the patient or the bystander, what kind of injury and what is the mode of injury and whether the patient has any pain in the abdomen, loin region, that will give you some clue. And ask about if you think about some abdominal trauma or the loin trauma, you need to ask how is the urine flow and is he, whether he is passing any blood in the urine, we need to ask. If the patient says after the trauma in the back, if he passed blood in the urine, then very high suspicious for the renal injuries. And during the examination also, we need to perform a thorough examination, examine the tummy for any tenderness in the subcostal region or loin region. We need to turn the patient to one side and look at the back side for any abrasion, contusion, and you can feel gently over the lower rib cage, feeling for any rib fractures, subcap of subcutaneous reputations that give you some clue patient have the refractions. If you suspect a refracture, you need to think about underlying kidney injuries. And if you move to the investigations, so no specific investigations, a laboratory investigation, but if a patient comes to you completely fine, but he told there's a line tenderness following the fall or someone kick on the back side and he felt one drop of blood in the urine then there's a suspicion after that he's telling his flow is good in that case you can do some urine dipstick to make sure no red cells in the urine that's the only reason but if the patient tells about cross hematuria or passing blood then you don't need to do this urine full report the blood Wise, the full blood count is very important to monitor the hemoglobin level because if the patient has the kidney injury and if the bleeding is happening in the retroperitoneum, you need to monitor the full blood count like twice daily, then you can have a look what's happened. But that's dependent on the severity of the injury. If the patient is already hypertension, you need to repeat the full blood count more urgent. But if the patient is clinically stable, but you are monitoring the patient, in that case, just do the Put back on one is the morning and one in the evening, then you can observe what's happened to the HP level. So if the HP level is dropping and patient is complaining about more pain, then we need to think about the hematoma around the kidney is expanding further. But if the patient is doing well, no further pain, but you need to make sure the patient is safe to discharge. For that also, you need to do the serial HP monitoring for 48 to 72 hours to decide whether you can able to send the patient home or not. Renal function will give us a clue whether the patient have any pre-existing kidney problem. If you have any pre-existing kidney, that may get worse. Otherwise, most of the time, the renal trauma won't cause any trouble with the renal function. That's also important for us to do this contrast CT imaging. So that will the CD contrast study will categorize these renal injuries correctly. So for that also the renal function is very important. If you want the imaging, so who comes with this trauma, we are doing the pass scan quickly to look at the tummy. 
So if you see any free fluids, you are thinking about any solid organ injury. So if any solid organ injuries, most of the time you're thinking either liver or spleen, depending on the site of the injury. If any liver or spleen injury suspicious, we need to suspicious for the renal injury also. And if you are suspecting any free fluids, we always ordering for a CT scan. So depending on the urgency, you can get a very quick uh, CT scan without any contrast study to give us a very early idea whether the patient need to go to the theater or we can manage the patient in the ward setup. So if you've done it, so you don't need to worry about the contrast study at the initial stage, just do a CT scan. Then the CT scan, so you, which solid organ is get damaged? Is there any liver, spleen? If it is kidney injury, you can see some hematoma around the kidney. So you can compare with the other side, the size of the kidneys or expand more or big hematoma around the kidney. So you can find the rib fractures and everything. That's give us a clue. The patient got a kidney injury. Later, it's not urgent. Later for the category of this type of the renal injury, whether it's a grade one or grade two, or grade three, grade four, you need the contrast study. But if you see at the initial stage, the patient have a very large hematoma in the retroperitoneum. Ideally, we need to arrange for a contrast study with the angiogram immediately because most of the time it's maybe a grade four or grade five injury. So we need to ask the intervention radiologist involvement quite early rather than delaying it later. So starting from the first scan, give us a clue whether there's a fluid in the tummy. So depending on that, you can arrange for an urgent CT. So whether it is, if available, you can go ahead with the contrast study, but that's not mandatory to delay the operative intervention. But once the patient is stabilized, you always need a contrast study or the CT intravenous urogram to categorize this or grading the injury. The management always starting with the ATLS protocol and I'm just talking about the kidney injury management. So if you are thinking no other injuries, so you evaluate the patient, the patient is fine, no other injuries, then we'll come to the kidney injuries. So if the patient has isolated kidney injuries, then the management options can be broadly categorized into non-operative management and the operative management. The non-operative management consists of two parts, the conservative and the intervention radiologist involvement. Operative management is rarely indicated nowadays. Most of the time it's associated with other solid organ injuries. Patient required laparotomy immediately. So patient is quite unstable. Those are the scenarios only we need to consider the operative intervention. Conservative management, so up to grade four renal injuries, we can manage the patient conservatively. So conservative is 70 percent, 70 to 80 percent of the kidney injuries can be managed conservatively up to grade four. So it consists of certain steps. So if a patient comes to your ward uh, from the surgical casualty ward, they diagnose there's an isolated kidney injuries, and we need to manage the kidney injury for the rest of the or next 48 to 72 hours. They transfer the patient to the surgical ward. Then we need to give the proper instruction to the patient and the nurses. So a strict bed rest means patient has to be on the bed for the first 48 hours, strict on bed, not to move because there's a hematoma form around the kidney and a seal of the vessel. But it's causing a very temporary temporary effect. If the patient is moving here and there or rotating, then what will happen, the hematoma can disrupt and so open up the vessel and expand in the hematoma further. The, so while you are keeping the patient on the strict bed rest, you need to monitor the vitals, especially the heart rate and the abdominal examination and the blood pressure. If everything goes well, patient feeling better, no drop in blood pressure, heart rate is good for 48 hours, then the hematoma is not expanding and the patient's kidney injury is quite stable. If the patient is stable for 48 hours with the strict bed rest, no drop in HP, then you can advise the patient to move from the bed to the chair and do very minimum walk around the bed and see what's happening. But if the patient's HV is dropping tachycardia, continue the bed rest, you may need to think about repeating the CT scan with the contrast study. Intervention radiologist involvement. So first we are managing conservatively 
and monitoring this part and monitoring the patients for pain or examine the tummy. So if you already felt a hematoma, you can see whether the hematoma is expanding or not. And the heart rate and the blood pressure, if it's persistently tachycardia progressing and you are repeating the HP and if the HP is dropping, you are thinking hematoma is expanding. The reason for hematoma is expanding, there may be a continuous arterial bleeding. That's the immediate cause for this bleeding. So then you need to repeat the imaging with the angiogram. If the angiogram says some leakage or contrast leak into the hematoma, that means there's active bleeding. Then we need to ask the interventional radiology. At the same time, they can able to embolize the particular segment of the artery, depend on the injury. Sometimes their intervention is required at the early stage. If the patient is quite unstable, BP is dropping, so quick, Procedure if it is an isolated renal injury, you can ask to embolize the main artery. Then we can resuscitate the patient and we can take him later to the theater for a nephrectomy. But that's not the indicator most of the time. So, mainly the segmental arterial bleeding. So, they can easily to go and embolize the particular segment. That won't affect the kidney function. It may affect marginally, but it won't kill the kidney. Operative intervention. Uh, its main aim is to arrest the hemorrhage and we need to preserve the kidney also. This is mostly indicated hemodynamically unstable and who required the laparotomy immediately, we need to think about that. So patient went to the theater for other solid organ injury and they opened the tummy and they find there's a pulsatile hematoma in the retroperitoneum and expanding very quickly and the patient is unstable, then they are thinking about either major vessel damage or the kidney injury. Or oh, it's indicated it's isolated penetrating injury and the patient is quite unstable, we need to take him to the theater. Or oh, it's a grade five high level vascular or renal artery rupture, we need to take him to the theater. So the main aim, even if you went into the retroperitoneum, we need to think about just first control the bleeding by putting some sutures over the kidney. That's called renal rape. And in case if it is shattered upper and lower and we can consider the remove the part of the kidney and suture the rest of the part of the kidney. Rarely, we may need to consider the nephrectomy to control the bleeding. Follow-up plan. So once you are planning to isolate a kidney injury and if you are planning to discharge the patient, usually we need to advise the patient to stay at home without doing any major work or anything so for first two weeks time, then very minimum work for next four to six weeks time. He can't do any kind of heavy lifting or straining. So that will cause further bleeding. And imaging, usually indicated in three months' time, you can consider repeating the ultrasound scan or CT to see what's happened with the hematoma, whether it is resolving. But most of the time, the follow up is specific to the case by case, depending on the case injury, associated injury, your follow up plan can be changing. While he's on, while the patient's on follow up, there are various things can happen to the patient. Bleeding can, secondary bleeding, most of the time it's due to the artery venous fistula or pseudoaneurysm. Sometimes his hematoma got infected and they can present back to the hospital with the infection. Perinephric collection, that hematoma get infected and causing abscess. If it's a great, point theory and it can be associated with the urinal malformation. If the hematoma is quite big, that can cause compression on the renal artery and causing this hypertension, it's may call page kidney. And hydronephrosis, if the hematoma is compressing the ureter, sometimes patient can present with this hydronephrosis. Stone formation, very late complication, whatever the scars in the kidney or calcium system can act as a nidus for stone formation. I think that's the quick brief introduction to the kidney injuries and its management. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to present to these junior doctors. Thank you, College of Surgeons and the Ministry of Health to give this opportunity. Any questions?
Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shivar Sankar, uh, in the comprehensive lecture. So uh, if you all have any questions, just ask or type in. Uh, in the meantime, we have the next lecture on uh, vascular injuries, supposed to do by Dr. Nalak Gunawas. I suppose uh, he's joining now. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, I'm Dr. Gayanekanaka here. This is regarding uh, the uh, uh, talks up to now. Uh, does anybody have uh, questions? Uh, sorry. That we can. Uh, yeah. So, um, till the next speaker joins, I will be uh, doing something about. I will be doing something about dressings. So dressings in surgery is a major topic that uh, uh, you guys need to know a little bit about uh, the concepts, why we put dressings and how to, um, how to select dressings for patients. So um, which, is, which is an important topic. Um, so I will be... Uh, uh, talking about dressings for about another um, uh, 15 minutes or so.
uh so this is about dressing in surgery which is a uh, which is not taught anywhere so i we thought of uh, uh, everybody is talking about big high fi uh, topics uh, but you need to know what is a dressing why we put dressings uh, and types of dressing that you have and what are the advanced dressing that uh, patients are given now these nowadays so, um, so you need to make it full screen yeah i'll i'll do it excuse me a second right okay uh, so these are basic principles of our dressing so why we need dressing is a very interesting thing that uh, provide a, a temporary protective physical barrier and uh, absorb wound drainage and provide a moisture necessary to optimize reepithelialization so these are the key uh, components of a dressing why we put dressing if somebody asks why we put dressing these are the uh, these are the answers that we give so so they are good for um, open wounds so otherwise you get higher rate of infection if you don't uh, close it and uh, sutured wounds uh, why we need to put any uh, dressings for sutured wounds it is to initial protection of suture lines because suture lines are still patent so they are it's, it's almost a open uh, it's a open uh, slit so we want to wait till the epithelialization take um take place and uh, man how to manage the exudate which is important thing where there's a exudate so anticipation of the exudate assessment of the exudate targeting optimal exudate and treating the exudate and dressings for exudate so dressing for exudate we will be um we will be talking about dressings for exudate as well now so management approach for non infected wound which is important um so goal goal is to protect uh, the, the either it's they, this this diagram is very important to dissect they de decide what dressing to be used so which is a very important um uh, important decision uh, making a slide so there are uh, either they are granulating wounds or they are necrotic wounds so uh, it it the also the um, it's a draining wound or a non draining that means there is the exudate exudative types of wound or a non exudative type of wound so these are the key points how you how you decide uh, decide how to decide um to which dressing to be used on a particular type of wound so this is one of the best uh, slides that i have come across now when you take uh, take in account of the skin skin anatomy is something like that there are two types of skin in humans which is called um hairless skin or the glabrous type of skin and non glabrous type or, or thin skin where the hair hair follicles are there so which these are important um things that we uh, the, because the thickness of the dermis varies with the uh, and also with the hair follicle depth also changes from one place to another now we are not going to talk about these terminologies there is epidermis dermis hypodermis and skin appendages so important to know all these structures and the definition of uh, wounds we have acute wounds and chronic wounds remember that acute surgical wounds um you are usually due to clean cuts and trauma wounds and also burns and uh, apart from chronic wounds we have pressure injuries uh, pressure wounds and infected wounds now when you when you talk about this there is a acute wound and a chronic wound if you see uh, what is happening the chronic wound has lots of lots of uh, uh, tissue reactions scarring whereas an acute one it doesn't have anything just a opening of the skin now wound bed, when you talk to your boss about the wound bed you need to talk about whether it's granulating or not and whether the granulation are healthy or not so how do you decide a healthy granulation so healthy granulation is usually a pin pin head size pin head size that means the the the, the uh, alpenetic and alpenetic tip peg uh, not the tip uh, but the the sh not the sharp one alpenetic head digger so uh, pin head size um pinkish red moist tissue so it uh, those are the uh, equal size ones are the uh, ones we uh, decide once we uh, name as 
healthy granulation tissue. So then there is epithelializing wounds. When there is epithelium, you can see some of the pinkish white, uh, uh, the skin epithelium just trying to migrate uh, to cover the wound. Then you have sloughy wounds where there's presence of devitalized yellowish tissue and uh, there should be some accumulation of, there may be accumulation of dead tissue, that, but they are not pus. Remember that pus is different from slough. And necrotic tissue is dif uh, different from uh, slough also. So necrotic mean, doesn't mean, slough is not necrotic tissue. Slough can be um, this, uh, they are usually slough is uh, one type of necrotic tissue where you have um, yellowish um, dead cells, accumulation of dead cells. Uh, but um, uh, the necrotic is something different that is due to, um, that is usually due to uh, uh, ischemia. Um, so uh, hypergranulation ones are also important that you say it's hypergranulating wounds. So this is what you call as a very nice pinkish red uh, equal size um, granulation. So it's a, uh, it's a healthy granulations. It has healthy granulations, whereas this has very unhealthy granulation tissue protein. Now that's the slough, and that is necrotic tissue, and you have hyper uh, hypergranulation as well. Now wound assessment usually we measure wound uh, uh, size with the measure measurements. And these are transparent dress things that we put on wounds and calculate the wound size. And we have uh, depth measurements also using various techniques. Now, exudate is usually produced by all wounds. Either it's a acute or a chronic, you have exudative wounds. And they and cleanse the wound. And main by doing that, they promote epithelization. Um, so you need to actually assess these things. And these are the, these are the common types of exudate: you know, serous exudate, hemoserous exudate, sanguineous exudate, and parulent exudate. So you need to uh, you need to mention what.
uh, there was a connection disruption and I was not expecting that, but uh, we'll, we'll continue the talk. And uh, this is a hemosanguinous, I'm not sure where I left, but uh, hope this is the place. Hemosanguinous, uh, uh, we, uh, oh, so when there is, uh, when there is uh, infection, usually we see all these changes happening, redness, increased amount of exudate and malodor. You know, it's, it's, with the smell, you can say that whether this is a pseudomonas infection or MRSA or coliforms or proteus. Um, and um, sometimes you can even, some people, even Klebsiella, can, you can uh, say whether this is type of infection. So you can actually guess from the exudate what is the type of um, uh, bacteria that is present uh, in the wound? Right. So, surrounding skin is another important thing uh, when you decide decide to do, especially flaps and uh, you know uh, the various types of uh, reconstruction. So, uh, whether this healthy, macerated, dry, flaky, eczematous, or fragile and um, edematous and erythematous. Um, yes. Hello? Hello? Oh, hey. How do you have four o'clock? I'll be there. Okay, now, pain is another important thing. So um, now you need to talk about pain. Now, if the pain patterns are not really uh, 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 test. and pain is very important that uh, you might need to give the pain relief before removing the dressings. Remember, 30 minutes before removing the dressings, you need to give the pain relief. Hello? Yeah. Uh, can I call you back? Quickly. Okay. These, are, these are some of the very important definitions I think microbiologists would have uh, talked about these things. When you call contamination, which is what is contamination? Bacteria is on the surface, no division is occurring, and no impairment to healing. It's very important to know that they, this is called contamination. Colonization is another thing that colonization is, um, uh, is something different. So the colonization where the bacteria are dividing, but there is still no, uh, it's not really. Uh, getting infected or have, uh, the wound is not getting infected. Now you have critical colonization or the topical infection. Now you, the bacteria is present and it may be, there may be a biofilm and you can have a hypergranulation. So those things are there. And local infection, now the bacteria has started to uh, invade these product, uh, tissues and started dividing. Now again, then regional spreading infection and uh, cellulitis can be there and you can go into sepsis. So the important to know what is the type of infect, uh, impairment and the bacterial activity that you're dealing with. So up to that point, any questions? Does anyone have questions? Any questions? I will check whether the next lecture is Dr. Chatu, uh, uh, is Dr. Janasekaram um, around? Not yet, sir. Uh, okay. um, now I've got some questions. Uh, sir, could you please give us the presentation? It's already in, uh, this presentation is already in the um uh, already in uh, the slapras.com so just go to the site and slapras.com if you go there we will have these all the presentations will be there so does the slough causes reduction in uh, uh somebody asks um slough cause reduction of wound healing um yes uh, there is uh, slough is actually it doesn't cause uh, delay in uh, wound healing, but uh, the um, 
it is actually an indication where the wound is poorly healing due to some some problem why the wounds are not healing and uh, wounds are uh, slow to heal is usually due to uh, uh, where the, the acute inflammation is arrested in some some phase where there's attempts to heal as well as ongoing inflammation so the inflammation should stop at a point when it doesn't stop you know that is is due to it's due to um, uh, it's usually due to a uh due to a chronic uh, due to some sort of a agent that is stopping the cascade of inflammation meeting completed so it may be uh, something that is a vicious thing that is over producing some chemical which is a chemotactic agent it could be due to a it could be attracting more and more white cells it is dismantling lot of granulation tissue or it could be an a biofilm that is not allowing um allowing the, the the bacteria to be destroyed and is uh, continue to produce uh, bacterial products so those are important um important um the uh, concepts um the what we feel as uh, 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 now usually there are um uh the, the types of dressings now we didn't discuss about types of dressings so um now we will talk little bit about um now we'll talk about little bit about uh, wound cleansing and the types of dressing available uh for us uh patient uh, somebody is asking can patient get radiating pain with cellulitis um so you can get a say, radiating pain with cellulitis where you have um, a nerve entrapment where a nerve is going across the wound the nerve is going across the wound and it's getting compressed uh, or edematous uh, and compressed uh, due to this uh, problem and it can actually uh, give you, give you a false sense of pain in some areas where it is supplied so for example if you have a, a abscess on the arm upper arm where the abscess is compressing the ulnar nerve or um uh ulnar nerve i can give rise to hand pain so that's another thing so, uh, uh if we don't have remove slough it is only delay uh, is it only delayed healing no it's actually the other way around slough indicates that the wound is having a problem and which is not going to heal uh, acute by acute inflammation so it is very important that uh, slough is a indication of poor healing rather than uh, slough being a cause for poor healing so it's not the way not the way that you are thinking uh, it has to be the other way so all right okay so those are important things uh, give me a second i will uh, again wound cleansing has to be that so wound cleansing uh, what is wound cleansing so how to clean a wound so remove visible debris and devitalized tissue and remove dressing residue remove excessive or dry crusting exudate so this is these are the goals of wound cleansing now how we do it you do, we do it with um, uh, usually with water or saline uh, and this is uh, warm in our country it's already warm but in the other country it could be cold so you need to use warm stuff when you are when you are working in a cold environment maybe norelia you might in candy or norelia you might be able to you might need to use warm saline rather than um saline that is available on the shelf now irrigation is a preferred method rather than uh, uh, rather than um um rather than using a uh, soak go soap so cotton wool to um uh we you know we clean the wound so irrigation is the main thing and choice of dressing you need to uh, these are the features of a good dressing uh you can see them read them in the um read them in the uh, text that is provided in the association website um so and so these are the other features of uh, a good dressing so be cost effective um and um, it's comfortable for patient and non inflammable 
or non toxic those are important things now there are four types of dressings in the world so these are primary dressing which goes directly on the wound secondary dressing is the one that goes over the primary dressing and you have occlusive dressing where you cover the uh, seal the wound and you have semi occlusive dressing where you have some sort of a uh, some sort of movement of air uh, moisture uh, happens through the through the dressing so those are the four now these some of the modes of action of dressing so absorption is one thing and you have uh, allowing evaporation transmission so this is another uh, the uh, the rate is cal calculated and there is something that is important when you decide uh, what type of a dressing to be used and fluid retention is sometimes uh, is important and um, synthetic ghosts uh so these are types of dressings that you will see i will just um uh yeah so uh these are the uh types of uh, gauze that is that we are using and um, so only used on minor wounds and secondary dressing so uh with a secondary dressing so these are almost like gauze but it's a synthetic fiber gauze and you have then, then you have Uh, island dressing where you have a, um, a dress a primary dressing and already uh, incorporated secondary dressing so these are uh, these are for uh, very light um, uh, ex lightly exudating uh, wound types where it's not much that doesn't doesn't uh, get flooded with liquids now semi then there are, you have semi permeable ones with a uh, 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 island so those are primary dressings with semi permeable adhesive adhesive dressings which are good and non adherent moist dressings you have uh, these are uh, tool dressings or grass tool grass dressings or sometimes gauze impregnated with these are gauze impregnated with paraffin or similar products so you have different types of things so you can even have silicone uh, uh, dressings also something similar non adherent moisturizer and sometimes they can uh, they can be used on contaminated one so you can use a uh, uh, we can use something that is uh, impregnated with a uh, usually with a uh, antiseptic solution so those are called um, those are actually uh, uh, typical trade names are bactigrass zero form is not here bactigrass is available and a few seed tools a few few seed tools uh, so those are some of the uh, antiseptic containing uh, uh, antibiotic containing uh, things but we don't we don't generally advocate antibiotic containing ones antiseptic containing ones are okay to be used on infected wounds so these are non adherent uh, uh, dry wounds where these are these are for um, Uh, so uh, low to mid um, um, uh, moderately high uh, exudates can be ex uh, absorbed into these ones then you have ca the calcium alginate ones usually we use it for packing uh, uh, cavity wounds these are very nice uh, to have because they they promote granulating and foam dressings are usually used on uh, bed sores and um, dry bed sores especially dry bed sores it provides a cushion barrier and also some level of absorption now next one is important the hydrocolloid dressings uh, the hydrocolloid dressings are usually uh, you can use on small burns and it promotes wound healing and it's um, and it's pain relief also sometimes pain relief also hydrogels as uh, you use intracyte gel uh, comfortable uh, you know this uh, these are some of the gels that we have and they can be used to promote healing usually uh, not used on uh, heavy wound heavy exudating wounds but uh, other any other wound you can use this uh, hydrogels and hydrofiber is also there but then they get wet only they become um, they they can soak up lot of um, a uh, lot of exudate into the into the dressing and now um, these are hypertonic saline impregnated dressing they are coming to the market now these are these are quite useful for uh, sloughy wounds where the stuff can get uh, quickly uh, separated by using these hypertonic dressings 
Now the collagen is another one that we use for burns. You might get in, get to see these things when you get a burn child or a adult, where we remove the burn uh, burn under the under general anesthetic. That means scrub the burn and apply collagen you, only for superficial burns. Don't apply this on uh, mid dermal or deep burns. So I have talked about this. If you apply, the patient is my patient might die with uh, hidden sepsis under this under this resin. So cadaveric skin is also provide in Sri Lanka. We have now cadaveric skin. Usually we have cryo preserved where it's liquid, uh, frozen in liquid nitrogen. It's just uh, anyone can donate. Any dead person can donate skin to the skin bank, and they can we can we can actually preserve it to put on a burn patient as a temporary cover. We can keep it for about a week. And live donor, mother to neonate. Yeah, I don't think it has happened here, but it's available in other countries. And artificial skin is there. You have um, artificial skin is usually you have collagen layer and a, a silicone layer. So those are artificial skin. And synthetic skin is something different where we, uh, so artificial skin can be uh, as, uh, biological or non-biological, uh, non but synthetic skin is usually uh, non-biological but biodegradable very expensive and but they are very uh, very good to have if you have money you can just uh, get the dermis regenerating very quickly and silver dressings are there these are specific for burns don't use them on chronic wounds if somebody is using just prevent using them because these are uh, specially manufactured for burns it doesn't uh, it's it's very expensive and it's very uh, it's not nice to use them and destroy the uh, limited resources if you uh, on wounds. Our next one is a negative pressure wound therapy. You know you have uh, we will see where these these things are now available freely, and we uh, apply suction on wounds so wound heals pretty rapidly. And fixation sheets are there, so you have uh, different types. Now this is available in the health ministry. After a long battle, we got them and removed the other uh, products uh, because these are the more human friendly dressings and very very uh, cost effective although you think it's expensive they are cost effective now cotton crepe bandages are there cotton crepe bandages are very uh, latex free and they are permeable and they have varying sizes and the one best best cotton crepe bandages are produced in sri lanka they are called fine fine techs and it's very nice to use them on patients you don't use uh, uh, elasticated crepe bandages are not meant to be used on normal uh, normal uh, normal injury. These are specific for orthopedic surgeons. They have they 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 have specific indication for these elasticated crepe bandages. Don't use them on uh, normal wounds and normal limbs and uh, you know uh, to give compression. These are these are highly compressible and also uh, they they tend to have higher rate of allergies. So that is it. I'm. Um, yeah, I'm finishing up. Thank you for listening to these uh, talks because these topics are not uh, taught anywhere. And um, uh, I see Dr. Nan Sekram has come to the college and he's going to deliver the, one of the most important topics today. Uh, it's on uh, fracture management. He's a um, he's an excellent orthopedic surgeon and uh, and a uh, person who contributes every time and uh, every now and then to upgrade and. Um, um, uplift the standard of care in orthopedic uh, patients and um, uh, please uh, uh, Dr. Nansekum, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. I'm just going to show, stop the share so you can share it. Good afternoon. Hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. We can hear you and your slides are moving. We can start, sir. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so it's after that very long day with hectic schedule. Uh, 
So in trouble, you are, will you be able to use uh, earphones if you have? It's a little bit of yeah. echoing, sir. I think there's another one. Uh, Is there any uh, device switched on similarly with uh, on Zoom? No. No, I don't think. Is it echo? Oh, okay. Can we get the computer a bit, bit closer, you, sir? Closer to me. Because a bit of echoing there. How, right. how does it? How does it? Much better, yes. All right. Okay, good afternoon. So after a hectic schedule, uh, we'll go for a very important topic. Hope this topic will keep you interested and keep you awake. It's about low limb fractures. Now, looking at the topic, don't expect this to be an orthopedic lecture. This will be a lecture for the intern medical officers and not for the orthopedic trainees. This will be a very important lecture for your day-to-day -day activities as an intern medical officer or a primary doctor in a clinical setup. Why this is important? It's, it's one of a very common uh, non-communicable disease uh, in terms of morbidity and mobility, mobility, mobility and mortality. It's a major health sector burden. Uh, and it's economic burden for the country as well as for the family who sustain a fracture. And most of the people who sustain these fractures are otherwise healthy population. So they are physiologically normal, suddenly get into a tragedy and come with, an, come with a fracture. So they are otherwise healthy population. So their demands are very high. It's something like a pregnancy who are physiologically normal. So we are dealing with the otherwise healthy people who have come with a fracture. So an initial active management makes a big difference. And that is what very important. Initial active management makes a big difference. And what you do initially decides the outcome. And there are most of the time there are medical legal implications and not done anything, not done the ideal thing at the initial. It gives a long-term permanent disability. So it's an important issue in your day-to-day -day management as an intern medical officer. So what is the role of an intern medical officer? You will be not posted to an orthopedic unit, but you will work in surgical units where there is no orthopedic surgeon in your institution. Or else you will work in surgical units sharing the care of orthopedic patients as the orthopedic units in your hospital have limited resources in terms of human resource or infrastructure. So you will be carrying orthopedic patients as an intern medical officer under your surgeon. So you should know about something about fractures, apart from your medical faculty knowledge. The fractures can be either fragility fractures where you sustain after a trivial fall or a high velocity fractures. The fractures can be an open fracture, which is known as a compound fracture, a closed fracture. These two are very important for you to identify when you decide upon the management. The fracture can be a simple fracture, a commuted fracture. Mostly it is important for a surgeon to decide the surgical fixed management. Again, the fracture configuration can be a transverse fracture, oblique fracture, or spiral fracture. So how do you know a patient has come with a fracture? There will be history of trauma. This trauma could be fall from a height, road traffic accident, slip and fall, so many things. So when the patient presents with a history of trauma, patient will complain of pain, unable to, difficult to walk, and there will be difficulty of lower limb, deformity of lower limb, or there will be open wound. When, and if there is a severe, severe open wound, then you may have to suspect the underlying fracture because if the severe open wound, deep laceration, then the, the pain of the wound, patient might not uh, complain of a pain such suspective of a fracture. So when there is a deep wound, then you have to think there could there could be underlying underlying fracture. So then based on clinical presentation, you may think whether I might because you won't. Ex ex receive a patient saying that, doctor, I'm having a fracture, please treat me. 
No, so patient will come and say, I have, I have a fall and I have a pain, I am unable to walk, so on and so forth. So, now with this picture, now, now, now you all have to imagine, as I told you, this is not a theory, theory lecture, this is not, this is, so, this is a lecture I have specifically prepared for you all, few slides, considering you as a house officer working in a surgical ward. This is not a this is not a lecture to teach you for any exam. I would, but still you can pass a clinical exam, but not for any theory paper. This is a total clinical discussion with you all, but unfortunately it's a Zoom lecture. So now clinical assessment. So what I mean by clinical assessment is as medical students will you would have come to know when you are especially when you are doing professorial appointment. Uh, and you would have worked closely with house officers. When a patient comes, uh, the popular term you would have heard is, uh, the nurse would have come and say, a doctor, my patient have with a clock grinder. I hate the term clocking. And you also should work in a such a way, we eradicate the term clocking. There shouldn't, shouldn't be a term in the history of medical history, there shouldn't be a term called clocking. Clocking should be done by clocks. You all, as doctors, as the cream of the society, taught by the eminent teachers in this country, you don't clock. You assess the patient clinically. So that is why I purposely made clinical assessment. Whenever a patient comes, whether it is surgical, medical, gynecology, psychiatry, whatever it is, you are assessing a patient. Your assessment of one patient differ from another patient. So clinical assessment is done by history taking and examination. And mind you, history taking and exa examination will differ from patient to patient. For the same patient, for, for one complaint to another complaint. It is only in the third year when you were initially taught to take history taking examination, you have a template where you say presenting complaint, history of presenting complaint, past medical history, surgical history, family history, social history, like you make a template and you fill in the form. That may be suitable to say to, to be done by a clerk or even a monkey. But you all have now a wide spectrum of knowledge. Now you're going to apply the knowledge. So it is clinical assessment. So I'm just spending few minutes of Emphasizing the clinical assessment, please practice this habit of clinically assessing a patient based on the based on the preceding complaint of the patient. Okay, and subsequently initial investigation. So I will try to teach you that also in the base place based on this fracture. When a patient comes with fracture, you think, what time am I going to this patient? My aim is to make this patient back to normal. And especially as a surgical lecture, as a surgeon, you always want to put the patient back to normal. As a joke, it's well known. If somebody asks you what is the difference between surgeon and a physician, there may be many differences. Surgeons cure, physicians control. You control diabetes, you control di hypertension, you control ischemic heart disease, but you can't cure any of, any of those things. A surgeon operates and cure. Like that, fractures also, you want to cure it. So you have to assess and investigate properly. Okay. So when a patient, as I told you, patient comes with a fracture, depending on the presenting complaint and presenting scenario, as I mentioned here, you would know the patient is thought to have a fracture. Then first your mindset goes, I have to assess the severity. So you will, you will first, first thing in your mind is to assess the severity. So based on that, we'll go to the history of trauma. What could be the trauma? Whether it is a high velocity injury or sports injury, whether it's a, it's, it's a collided, it's a three wheel has toppled, whether the head on collision with the, with the tipper or lorry, or it's a slip and fall of an elderly lady, uh, elderly, old lady, like a 90-year-old lady, slipped and fall, uh, 
fall from a scaffolding of 20 feet high. So, and what is, we have to assess the severity. And based on that, uh, we, have to, we have to go for a, if it is a high velocity injury, multi, multiple injury polytrauma, then you have to think about A, B, C, D, A, T, L, S protocol, airway breathing, cycle spine disability, and so on, the protocol. So that is the first thing. Though it is fracture, you should never forget trauma patient, high velocity trauma patient, A, B, C, D protocol. So that is, so, so that is the first thing in mind. Second, you have to establish the injury. The patient comes with low limb fracture, there are various varieties of low limb fracture starting from the acetabula to the terminal phalanx. So I'm not going to tell the list out the possible fractures in low limb fracture because you all know the bone, every bone can fracture. So there's, I have not mentioned the single fracture name here because you all know the anatomy, you all know the names of the bone, every bone can fracture from the uh, acetabula, femoral head to neck to sharp to terminal phalanx, everything can fracture. So now you have to establish the injury. So history about, so when, once you have to know about the history about the trauma, because now you have, to, you have to investigate. Now you are not going to take the whole body x-ray, whole body CT scan, no. You have to focus. That is what I said. It's not clogging. It's assessment. So now you are doing clinical assessment for second part, because you are going to narrow down your investigation. You are going to narrow down your examination, so you are narrowing down. You talk, you take history, then you narrow down your examination, then you narrow down your uh, X-ray, radiable, and CT and CT scan. So history about the trauma will give you what part is injured. And you all know, if the patient has fallen from height of 20 feet, then fractures possible are calcaneal fracture or hip fracture and spine, which is not a low limb injury today in this topic, like that. If the patient is a front seat passenger, head-on collision, dashboard injury, maybe a hip fracture dislocation. So you will get the history to know, get the history about the incident, which will, for the 90-year-old lady, slipped and fall, and unable to stand up and walk, then you know it's a neck or femur fracture. So like that, you will take a history to establish the injury. And there are other things also you take history now and give the idea. Then you will examine in the examination of the lower limb. That is to establish the injury, whether it is external or rotated leg, that could be neck or femur fracture, and we are at the which point the uh, which point the leg is swollen, which where is the deformity, and those things. Then you go, then you go for the relevant say to establish the injury. And if when you know it is when you localize the place, the common common rule of thumb is two joints, two views. If you are suspecting in the mid thigh, then that is femur. You have to include the hip joint, knee joint, and two two views, AP and lateral. If you are suspecting tibia, then should include the knee joint, ankle joint, and AP and lateral. And when it comes to x-ray of a bone, I am repeatedly telling you, please write the bone's name. There is nothing called x-ray type. You might be thinking, why well, I'm talking nonsense. No, I have seen repeatedly there are house officers who are writing x-ray type. And what is worrying me is when these x-rays go to the radio, department, the radiographers who are supposed to be lower grade, lower level ranking than you all laugh at you. Minna Balanda doctor can clear to x-ray color. And they take a photograph and they circulate among themselves and laugh at you. So that is why this is very important. These courses are very important where you would have had different level of training in different type of universities and different exposures. It's you. Uh, but you must make sure you continue to learn X-ray of a bone means you have to write the bone name and you have to include two joints and you have to include two views and make sure now you are entering to the competent in a competent world. The nurses are very well getting educated. So the radiographers are getting educated. Physiotherapists are getting educated and sometimes Fortunately, unfortunately, they are more keen in learning. 
So it is very important. You have to keep on learning, keep on educating, and keep on building up your knowledge. And I was told that there were 300 participants today in this lecture. I don't know what is happening to others. If it is, if you are not joining, it is very sad. But those who are joining, you have joined today and going to join tomorrow. Make sure you make the maximum of it. And this is a foundation and build on it. So this is very important. I'm repeatedly stressing you have to take the relevant X-ray. And this especially when you are, you can, when you have been corrected, when you have been corrected by your seniors, it is a learning opportunity. But when you have been corrected by your juniors, it is ridiculed. So don't learn from your seniors, but don't make yourself to be ridiculed by people who are lower than you. So quickly learn from your seniors. So it's very important filling the forms in a proper way. And I think there are other lectures for that on that link. So X-ray is a basic, and there is a place for CT scan, especially when the fracture is within the joint especially it's within the ankle joint, within the knee joint, proximal tibia, uh, distal femur, distal tibia, tail, talus, calcaneum, to study the articular surface, joint surface. But usually that decision is not taken by an intern house officer. But when you are finishing your career and when you become a smart house officer, probably the consultant may accept you writing for the CT when you are written for a correct CT, but it's good to know. So this is establishing the injury. Another important thing which I have made it a separate problem is you have to when a fracture comes, you have to make sure it is an open fracture or closed fracture. That is very important because you can't see wounds. You have to look for wounds. Patient doesn't come and tell you, doctor, I have got an open fracture, I have got a fracture and I have got a wound. If you get that patient, you are lucky. Most of the time you don't get it. You have to look for wounds. You have to say a fracture could be an open fracture until confirmed otherwise. How do you confirm? Wound won't be seen. You have to look for it. You have to look around for it. You have to explore it. And if there is a wound, that wound may be a incidental wound or wound communicating with the fracture to be a true compound fracture. You have to explore the wound. Explore means the patient is in pain. So within the limits, you have to explore the wound. So look for the wound, explore the wound, and confirm in the clinical level whether it's an open fracture or closed fracture because it's, the management is too different and the complications are far exceeding. And why I'm telling that, why I have made a separate slide rather than I have not Included that kind of fracture is infected bone is the last thing one person will ever want to have. Yeah, if if you are angry with somebody, you pray that patient should get an infected bone. That is the last thing one an orthopedic surgeon would like to have. Anybody would like to have. So don't never ever give an infected bone as as your complication. So immediately attend, you need to attend. It's an orthopedic emergency. So make sure you are not dealing with the compound fracture or if a compound fracture is not light. They say uh, a compound fracture should not see a sunset and a sunrise. It should see only either one. If it comes during a sunset, before the sunrise, it should have been attended. If it has come on a sunrise, before the sunset, it should be attended. It should not see a sunset and sunrise. I, I hope you have understood and you would have got the value of it. You, you would have understood the value of it. So make sure you are not dealing with a closed fra compound fracture and it has to be handled uh, urgently, very urgent. It's an orthopedic emergency. Next, very, very important. You have to assess the soft tissue complication. Okay? So most of the time assess now this is, of course, again, assessment means this is history and examination and mainly examination. This is also mainly examination. And most of the time, for these complications, patients will complain of pain and skin. What is the skin complication? There can be skin necrosis happening in the fractures where the fracture is tensed 
closer and has uh, skin blisters. And this is this happens closer to the ankle and closer to the knee. That is mainly where there is no subcutaneous tissue around the ankle and around the knee, around the ankle and around the knee, that is distal and proximal tibia. You have you get subcutaneous edema, subcutaneous to, uh, swelling, tight compartment. Distal neurology may be affected if there is you have to assess for neurology. And more importantly, distal vasculature, distal circulation, tendon ruptures, and embolism. It won't happen on admission unless that patient is a delayed presentation. That can be fat embolism in a long bone fracture, BVT if it is a four, three, four days old. And the most important thing is most of the people assess these things on admission, but what you don't understand is these have to be repeatedly, continuously monitored, assessed, and properly recorded. Recording is important. No point because you would have, there, there may be other lectures of record keeping and all. Then medical legal consequences and uh, litigation, legal challenging, everything can be countered, countered and uh, faced in the court of law if there's a proper recording. There's no point whatever you are doing unless you record it in the PhD, better teacher. So and most importantly, there can be a uh, circulation can be preserved on admission, but after some time, the circulation can be gradually stopped. There can be distal vascular injuries. I think there will be another lecture. It has already happened, especially when there's a fracture around the knee joint, distal femur, proximal tibia, for pedial artery injury, it can, can be intimal rupture and slow developing of thrombus can happen. So you have to repeatedly monitor mainly for vascular injury and also for developing compartment symptoms of tissue tightness, compartment syndrome. Then, now why, why are we all doing this? Why are we managing? Why are we assessing the patient? Is it to label the patient saying that we have a fracture? No, to manage him and making him back to normal. And as a surgeon, we have, we, it's most of them is surgery. So you have to assess the fitness for surgery in a fracture patient. And I'm not talking much about it because it is, it, it's as far as the fitness for surgery, we have to take his take them with investigation. Uh, and that is true for anything. So there's nothing specific for fracture that I'm not mentioning anything here depending on the age of the patient, medical condition and everything, whether it's a offering, anything. That's for any surgery, you have to do the same. Your, your clinical assessment should include that component as well. This is another reason why you assess the patient clinically. If the patient is going for surgery, your clinical assessment should include point number five is assess for fitness for surgery. So now you have assessed the patient. I'll just go through again, just to make sure now we have clinically assessed the patient and in initial investigation have been done to assess the severity, establish the injury, once the injury, and when you establish the injury, there is no point of not knowing whether it's open fracture or closed fracture, and not complication is part of the diagnosis, and assess the fitness for surgery. So when I say, uh, and, and you know, I use the word here, diagnosis. So I just want to go one step further. That will be useful for any part of your work. When I say diagnosis, you must always try to establish when whatever the disease, whether it is medicine, surgery, pediatrics, whatever the field you go, diagnosis doesn't mean, doesn't mean a pathology of the disease. It includes anatomy, anatomy of the tissue, pathology of the disease, etiology of the condition, uh, and complication and the disability. So when you do this clinical assessment, this is why I always say it's not clerking. Doctors don't clerk, our services don't clerk. They do clinical assessment, provided you do that job properly. Okay, let's say if you are a house of set dealing with a cardiac patient, you are going to assess properly and say the anatomy of the disease is mitral stenosis. And the 
etiology may be rheumatic valvular disease and the anatomy may be mitral valve the pathology may be stenosis etiology may be the rheumatic and the disease complication may be heart failure disability may be whatever the financial or loss of job or whatever the disability the financial social side disability can be economic social financial physical what it is all of this you have to assess and give a final diagnosis when your consultant comes what is this patient is not the ms is not a diagnosis mitral stenosis not a diagnosis diagnosis should have anatomy pathology etiology disability complication and a clerk can do this you have to prove you are not a clerk when you become house officer you must prove that you are a doctor who can clinically evaluate and assess the patient so that you can design a management you can design a management plan to design a management plan you should have assess the patient properly this is i say you are not a clerk you can't say, know that the word of clerking should be eliminated eradicated from the medical profession this is what i want okay now management initial management okay when a patient comes in fracture initial management what you have to do is reassure first thing you have to reassure but you should not overdo it. you should not say overdo and say don't run run we will do everything perfect but no you should not do that because as a house officer you will be not suitable enough to say what will be the exact outcome but two things you can say we will do our best and we will make you better these two things you can say but you will you can't com- confidently say uh, uh, we will make you back to normal because you don't know what is the situation and also you must understand uh, the limited resources are limited especially in the current context so we have a lot of issues so you can't commit let this leave it to the seniors at least you can say don't worry we we'll look after you we we'll do the best and we we'll try to make we we'll do our best and we we'll try to make you better don't worry so reassurance is very important that itself will reduce the pain uh, immobilize the patient that will reduce the pain uh, reduce the further soft tissue injury and will reduce the displacement of the fracture fragments immobilize the patient immobilize the limb immobilize the part of injured part and give analgesics and if it is compound fracture if it is a fracture with a open wound irrigate the wound and give start iv antibiotics i have not mentioned what is iv antibiotic because you have to follow your local hospital protocol depending with which is decided by your your surgeon and your microbiologist of your hospital so i do want to tell that and uh, make you to memorize that but make sure you have to give iv antibiotic remember that and go and go and ask follow the your ward protocol but iv antibiotic what has to be given immediately you have to give okay so that is the initial management and there will be definitive management so that is, that will be either manipulation and be your plaster of paris or surgical fixation which you will not be involved but once uh, 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 on the initial management this will be the definitive management so what is your role in the definitive management you have to prepare for anesthesia for which you have already done the history taking and examination and you have prepared and you have done the investigation which i have put a, i have made a slide previously and say for the anesthetic preparation you have to do you have to take consent i think there is a separate lecture for consenting that is applicable for here also you have to take, you have to do consent and you have to mark the site and it's very very important marking the site uh, especially if the fracture is a minimally displaced and sometimes there can be things can go wrong whether it's the right side or left side which which side to be operated so marking the site is very important. so that is with the part of the definitive management preparation what you will be doing so when a patient is come after the orthopedic surgery the immediate aftercare 
one thing anything after the surgery whether it's spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia the anesthetic after care you have to do that is that is common to all surgeries not, not that it's not only specific to orthopedic surgery but when it is specific to orthopedic surgery you have to look for tight plaster if the plaster of paris is applied you have to look for tight plaster of paris so mainly you have to look for the distal distal extremities so that it's pale color sorry pale uh, swallow uh, paresthesia uh, and movements motor movements power those things we look, look, look into and we will see, see what is distal, distal circulation neurology we have to assess and as i told earlier we have to continuously assess pain you have to continuously assess and you have to keep the limb ele elevated and very important when the patient complain take and give due due respect to the patient's complaint that is very important because patient don't take it for granted that patient is just complaining so very important we have to uh, give due respect to the patient's complaint and uh, look into that take this reaction so this is generally for orthopedic patients after care apart from the anesthesia monitoring for which will be doing for any surgery for ex distal extremities look for swelling whether it is a plaster of paris swelling or just just general limb swelling vasculature neurology and elevating the limb okay make it a habit when you do a walk around if a lower leg lower leg limb is uh, operated just keep your hand on the dorsal spadix and feel for it if the dorsal spadix is nicely pulsating you can have a peaceful sleep so subsequently advise to mobilize the joints if it is a plaster you have applied and uh, maybe the joints which is outside the plaster if the below elbow plaster is applied patient should mobilize the elbow and shoulder and the fingers outside the plaster mobilize the joints walking as as per the So it's just advice. Whether it's a partial weight bearing walking, one weight bearing walking, whatever. And there will definitely be some judicial work. We have to make sure the JMO has seen the patient, police have seen, and and they may do a medical legal examination form is filled, and the judicial medical officer has come there, come and taken the, come and taken the recordings. Is he taking? They have done the form filling properly, because. half of the factors are judicial related medical legal related accidents injuries trauma so uh, they have to support the submit a report to the courts and that is done by not by the surgeon it is done by the uh, judicial medical officer make sure that is done before the patient is discharged and writing a discharge summary and one thing if you are writing the discharge summary make sure you write the implant details properly sometimes this implants have to be removed and I, unlike in any other surgery orthopedic has different types of implant and different the, that needs specific instrumentation so sometimes this if the opnot says something specific you have to trans, transmit that to the diagnosis card properly because if the details are not there when there is an essence complication comes like an infection or something when we want to remove it if we don't know what is the correct what is the instrument we may not be able to remove it so the discharge summary should have the correct implant detail because from the x-ray we can sometimes say which manufacturer implant is applied to the patient so the implant detail the discharge summary diagnosis card is very important next is the long term care yeah. okay long term care uh one is one th one thing will be secondary prevention okay secondary pre prevention is one of the most important because almost all the fractures can be prevented okay yeah so if it is osteoporosis you have to treat the osteoporosis 
the elderly patient with osteoporotic fracture. Uh, so make sure the patient is referred to an osteoendocrine clinic or osteoporotic clinic. Yeah. I, have, I have there some more to write. If the patient is have his basic and the fall prevention. If the patient has fallen due to hearing defect, uh, eye defect, they may have to vision has to be vision has to be corrected. Here, hearing defect has to be corrected. If the fall was due to some medical issue, medical issues like uh, giddiness, vertigo, something like that, it has to be attended. If the if the road traffic accident was due to alcoholism, alcohol related, you may consider referring to the alcohol uh, withdrawal, alcohol treatment, treatment of substance abuse, curing the substance abuse through the psychiatric psychologist. So these all these things are important because sometimes you would have seen when you work in the accident service, it's the same person coming, same people are coming over and over again. That is because. The secondary prevention was not attended properly. And the long term is rehabilitation. You have to rehabilitate these patients, uh, physical rehabilitation, physiotherapy rehabilitation, depending on the severity of injury and the social care. So that's all for this topic. So I hope you would have understood the fracture management, low limb fracture. I have not specifically addressed any fracture because, for example, I have not talked about femur fracture, neck of femur fracture, PDR fracture, ankle fracture, anything in specific, because if you want to, if you touch any specific fracture, you can't finish it in half an hour. And that is not specifically uh, your topic. Uh, because that is, is that is, that will be the topic of orthopedic orthopedic doctors or orthopedic trainees or orthopedic posterior doctors. So this is generally for a house officer how to deal with the patient who would be presented to you whether whether you work uh, uh, who will come to you when you do a casualty surgical casualty after a trauma. The trauma could be in any severity. Whether it's a road traffic accident, train accident, tree falling on a bus, a slip and fall, maybe a child, fall in the, fall in the school, fall, fall from a scaffolding while a carpenter mending a roof, anything. So this is how you will be handling. So as I told you, when the what the, when the patient comes, your idea should be, I have to diagnose the fracture. I have to see whether there is a fracture, then I have to diagnose the fracture, make sure that it's, there is no wound. I have to prepare the patient, let the surgeons do the correct surgery, then I have to do the aftercare, make sure this patient is made back to normal, and also I must make sure this patient will not come again with another fracture. So the sequence of ideas should be in your mind. If you have that in mind, and when I say when I want to diagnose the fracture, I must diagnose it's not only anatomy of the Fracture, it is, a, it is a pathology of the fracture, it is a etiology of the fracture. Etiology, it is a complication, disability. So I have to find five points, then only my diagnosis is complete. So, like, cultivate this habit in your mind. Then you continue this habit to your postgraduate studies. And one thing I just want you to keep in mind if you want to do postgraduate, most of the postgraduates are clinical related, even if it is radiology. Or whatever it is, most of the postgraduate are patient related, unless it is very rare community medicine or something like that. Most of the postgraduate are clinical related. Those who do their internship, very committed, very observant, and very patient related, will excel in their postgraduate. There is no two words. They will never very difficult to fail them because. You will never forget what you work in there, what you do in the internship, the hardship you undergo, the, the memories of internship, how hard you work, how difficult, and you, so you save a lot of patients, and the memories, and what you did, and those investigations, and how the patient came, how the patient 
sent back. And those memories, you will never forget. Only thing is, that will always be in your memory, even after 20 to 30 years. So obviously, in two, three years, when you go to the postgraduate, you will easily answer. So try to have all these things in the mind. And few things I just want to say. Now you are going to start to work as doctors. Make sure you will uphold. And all of you, I know, became doctor because you look towards the doctors and make sure you work in a such a way that people who are 10 years, 15 years younger than you look at you and they want to become doctors. Just work like that. People 5, 10, 20 years, because we came as doctors because when you were children, we look at some people and we looked upwards them and we thought we also should become should become a doctor. And you also have become doctors because you would have admire at some people. And so our humble request is also, you also work in a such a way. Work means your dress code, your attitude towards patient, and your develop uh, your you are developing your skills, knowledge, everything should uphold the normal profession. And that should be in your writing, your diagnosis card, writing your BHD, communicating with the patients. And, and when you all you are on more than that, you know in the current days our profession is being attacked by all sorts of people, mostly because of jealousy, mostly because of jealousy on us, and partly because. Our own people are giving room for others to attack us. So jealousy, of course, we can't prevent. If whenever people go higher and higher, people are jealous because people are jealous at people are jealous at people who are educated. People are jealous at people who have money. When you have money and education both together, people are double jealous. So then you can't prevent it. But don't give room to make mistakes to come people to attack at public. So whenever a patient, all whenever a patient complains, give due respect. Another important thing, if you are kind and if you are accommodative and if you if the patient is satisfied with you, you will never fall into trouble. But if you this please keep in this advice that this is not found by me, this was told to me. And my colleagues, by a very, very senior, experienced, respected consultants, after so much of experience. So, when you, you, even if you do the right thing and if you are arrogant to patients, one day you will fall into trouble. And not only you, you will put your colleagues, senior colleagues, everybody into trouble. So, be kind to them, be accommodative, be receptive, and do the right thing. We have these are very important things. So this is a bit out of the topic, but more relevant to you. So with that, I think I finished my topic for today, and this may be the end of the day for you. And so I wish you all the best. And have a good career in medicine. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, comprehensive lecture. That was uh, Dr. Nana Sekaram, Senior Consultant, Orthopedic Surgeon at uh, CNTH Kalaboila. So uh, thank you, sir, once again. Uh, so we come to uh, today's uh, conclusion to today's program. But if you all have any questions, we can take one or two minutes to answer them. Uh, you can unmute and ask or you can type in. Uh, at the meantime, uh, tomorrow, day two of surgery session will start at 8 a.m. So make sure that you all join by 7.45. So plus we will take attendance for tomorrow as well and some information on internship as well. Right.
I think so. Today is no questions because we didn't have a lunch break as well. So thank you, sir, once again. Yeah, I think there's a question. Can I answer? Yes, sir, please. Yes. Yes, sorry. It's a very good question, which I thought I wanted to tell, but I forgot. I don't know who asked that question. It's a very good question. As far as fracture is concerned, NSA is not a preferred analysis because the uh, bone healing, fracture healing, and uh, NSA are the common prostaglandin pathway. So NSA uh, leads to poor bone healing and may lead to non pneumonia. So NSA is not used, it's preferable, better not used as analgesics in fractures. So preferred analgesics are basically paracetamol or fluid based analgesics, uh, pregabalin as a, as a painkiller, analgesics, pharmacological agents, uh, NSAIDs, uh, preferred, preferably not used or very minimally used, preferably not used uh, in fractures. Uh, immediately after fractures and fractures after surgeries, preferably opioids and uh, paracetamol or codeine, with paracetamol and pregabalin, gabalin, gabapain. It's a good question. Sorry, I wanted to say that, but uh, good. The person who asked it, very good. If you have any questions, you can still use this time to ask sir, or questions. Um, So there's a question. Uh, so what about uh, what about giving antibiotics to close fractures with superficial injuries, uh, injuries over lying? Yes, you have to give antibiotics, but uh, that antibiotic is that antibiotic is uh, is guided as, as for the wound. Uh, prophylactic antibiotic as as for the wound that that has that is not treated as a compound fracture. That is as a soft tissue injury. If you will treat the wound as if there is no uh, fracture. But what what this what matters is when are you going to fix the fracture? Uh, even in that case, also if the if the fracture needs a fixation, you either you fix the fracture within 12 hours to 24 hours before the colonized bacteria uh, multiplies, or you have to fix the fracture. After the after the uh, fracture, the wound is healed and the uh, colonized bacteria is eradicated. So, so that is a decision for a senior person. At your level, any wound uh, needs cleaning and antibiotic. Whether that antibiotic is a prophylactic antibiotic for 48 hours or a therapeutic antibiotic until the wound heals, uh, that will be decided. So Superficial soft tissue wound is not the topic here, so I didn't mention any wound. Whether any wound needs antibiotic, whether the duration of the antibiotic is a, it, it, it's on the merit of the uh, severity of the wound and subsequent outcome. And depending on the wound severity, whether it is a cleaning and dressing or wound toilet, will be different. Sometimes when there is a superficial wound in the bone, wound with a fracture. At the, as I told you, at the site of admission, you won't be able to establish whether the wound is communicating with the uh, fracture. So you have to take it to the theater and explore the wound and decide whether the wound is 
technically communicating with the fracture or not. Until such time, it is a compound fracture. Then at the theater only you decide, no, it is not a compound fracture because there is a soft tissue bridge or soft tissue barrier between the wound and the bone and the bone is not contaminated. So as far as your primary question is concerned, if there is a wound, yes, it needs antibiotic. And depending on the contamination, degree of contamination, communication with the fracture, the duration, duration of the, how quick you started the antibiotic, sometimes when the wound would have happened the day before yesterday, then patient came late, or you started immediately, and all those factors will depend when to stop the antibiotic. Uh, whether to give an IV or straight away oral is enough, or those. But with the need of antibiotic or not, yes, definitely you need. If you all have any questions, please uh, use the chat or can unmute. So I think that's all for today, sir. That's all the questions I think coming in. Uh, right, so, so any take home, take away home messages, sir, uh, want to convey? Yes. So the take home message with regard to compound fractures. First thing, fractures. Please make sure they are most of the time they are physiologically normal people like the pregnancy. They are physiologically normal due to some, whether they are elderly or young people, yeah, physiologically they are normal due to some strategy, they had a fracture. So our aim is to try to put back to normal position. That is one thing. Second thing, practical point, you may be working in a surgical unit, but then be an orthopedic surgeon in the nearby hospital or in your same hospital without any resources. So don't give a second class treatment to the orthopedic patients. Just because the same patient come with the tummy pain, it is your patient. The same patient coming with the fracture of a bone, it is a second class citizen. No. So it is, it's all our patient, whoever it is. Third thing, uh, very time compound fractures are uh, very, very most important fracture. And the first treatment, initial, immediate first treatment, takes, makes the major division, uh, decision in the life of the patient and the economic burden of the country. Sometimes, if the initial management fails, not done on time, that is irrigation of the wound, starting the IV antibiotic, and quick wound toilet. Why I'm telling quick wound toilet is sometimes the wound toilet are scheduled after all the general surgery cases are done and bottom in the list. And if no time, postpone to the next day. And when the bone gets infected, it costs millions to the government, millions to the health ministry. Whereas if a few thousand rupees, this surgery could have been saved if the wound toilet is done within six hours. But the poor patient is being brought all into the hospital just because thyroidectomy and uh, polycystectomy takes a priority. Uh, this compound fracture goes down. And we don't have a system in our uh, health ministry or government to audit the cost. Uh, the health economics are not properly audited. Why this much of money is going for antibiotic? Why this much of 10 wound toilets or 5 wound toilets are done? Uh, this 5 wound toilets, subsequent wound toilets are done just because only the first wound toilet was not done within 6 hours. Whereas the patient is in the hospital, but the priority was given for thyroid and the hernia, not for the 
Yeah, so not for the compound fracture. When it was fresh and needed only one wound pilot, but sometimes people doesn't prefer to give the first wound pilot within six hours, but they're happy to do 10 wound pilot after making it infected. So keep that in mind. Compound fracture is a very, very important patient, important injury because it is a it is a normal, physiologically normal person getting and properly done on time can save millions to the government and give a better quality life to the patient and the family. Sometimes the patient is a breadwinner and he, he she will have children, elderly parents to look after. Just go into their family into the mind and do. I don't, I'm not asking you to emo get emotion with them, but when you are taking a decision making, decision making and delivering the service, the limited resources, just consider that and don't take the emotion to the home. But when you're working, take the correct decision and just go home happily, but take the decision correctly and give due, due importance to the due correct injury. So this is what I want you to stay from. And also just make sure you are, when you are starting the career, this is the, how you start to work will reflect your own career. So it's a hard time, but it's not that hard like during our time or even before our time, but enjoy the internship, enjoy the work. Now you have to finish your one year. So just take it as a pleasurable time. The more you enjoy, the more you will like, and more you will remember, and more you will prosper in your career as a good doctor, good consultants, and you will like the field. And as I told you, as I told, as I tell many people, uh, our field of medicine, this profession, is your second life. And second life is more important. It's, a, it's like a second marriage. And this second marriage is more important because now you can't divorce. And you can't divorce and marry a new life, new, new profession. So you have to like it and enjoy it and live with it happily. You will end up your life. All the best. Right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your experience and guiding this new intern, sir. So we come to today's uh, end of the today's program. So uh, do join by tomorrow, 7.45. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.